be the symbol, the needful role of a commissar. I learned that lesson early. But in Hades, I had to be more. Be the legend. I crushed a green skin skull with a claw. I glared at the stunned brutes, and as my eye blazed with killing ruby light, I became their nightmare. Bellowed the orc warlord. Yorick, curse his eyed! Gazkor Thraka slumped into his throne, his eyes glowing red from under a furrowed brow. Around him, Gretchen scurried to clear away the debris of objects that he had smashed as he raged about Commissar Yarick. The throne room fell silent, apart from the noise made by the scurrying Gretchen. Then came a cough. Gaskell's eyes moved to the prostrate form of Big Boss Uzbek, who lay cowering on the floor in front of the throne. It was he that had informed Gaskell that Yarek was in the sector that Gaskell was preparing to attack. What is it, Uzbek? You useless piece of squeak dog! Gaskell snapped. The orc Big Boss cautiously stood up, dusting himself down as he did so. Well, boss. I just wanted to say that this Yarrick, well, he's only some pansy umi git, ain't he? He ain't no match for you, boss. I bet you're ready to smash him good and proper. <laughs> Uzbek's laughter slowly trailed off when he realized that Gazkor seemed not in the least bit amused by his attempt at cheering him up. Instead, the orc warlord had fixed Uzbek with his deep, steely gaze. Has it ever occurred to you? that this pansy oomen duffed over some of our toughest boys at the Battle of Hades Hive. That hive would have fallen into my hands if it weren't for him. He trained up the oomies what defended that place. He organized them. He led them into battle. He never gave up. Not ever. Sometimes I think that there's a bit of orc in him. Gaskell remembered that Armageddon campaign that had made both he and Yarrick famous. Gazoo had learned that Yarrick had been banished to Hades' Hive for opposing his planetary overlord. Yarrick had organized defense, which had halted Gaskell in his tracks. More and more of Gaskell's troops had been drawn into the battle, and although the Hive had eventually been overrun, the Orc army had been bled dry in the process. It had been the turning point in the campaign, it had all been down to one man, Commissar Yarrick. Yeah, but boss, he was lucky, weren't he? You duff him over easy next time, eh, boss? He ain't lucky. He makes his own luck, just like what I does. He best me that time I hate his eye, and he beat me fair and honest. Or oh, do you think all the human needs is luck to beat me? No. Nah. No, boss. Duh. That's not what I think. Honest, it ain't. Good. Cause I'd have to get rid of you if you thought that. Now wouldn't I? Gaskell's eyes blazed red, and Uzbek once more hurled himself to the floor and prostrated himself before the orc warlord. Never forget, Uzbek, that a worthy foe has been blessed by Mork and Gork to make us orcs the best warriors in the galaxy. If someone gives you a tough fight, you hate them. But you honor them too. Now that Yarrick, I hate them more than any of alive. But I honor. And with his help, your boys will be the toughest orcs in the galaxy. Now get out of my sight. Who's me? And don't come back until you know exactly where Yarrick is. And with that, he started to contemplate how he would defeat his greatest foe once and for all.
Safety is an illusion, boy. Never forget that. Adrenaline is your ally, boy. Don't mistake it for fear. They're not the same thing. Weigh everything against your survival. Live to fight. Don't throw everything away on lost causes. Something you want to say to me, boy? Said the Sarge. Bass's words came out as a growl that surprised even him. I know who you are. He told the old man. I know what you did, how you fought. Sheridan told me he called you an Imperial hero. A sudden scowl twisted those terrifying features. You think Imperial heroes live like this, you fool? The Sarge snapped back. He gestured at the dank, water-stained walls of their home. Sheridan had no business saying anything. I bet he didn't tell you I was stripped of my medals. I'll bet he didn't mention that I was dishonorably discharged after 40 bloody lashes. Sheridan sees what he wants to see. You hear me? I don't care about that. Bass shot back. He would not be denied. Not this time. You could teach me. You could help me, make me stronger. Make it so I could kill them if I wanted to. His grandfather held his gaze. For what seemed an eternity, neither blinked. I can teach you, the old man said at last, with a solemn nod. But it will hurt more than everything you've endured so far. And there's no going back once we start, so you better be damn sure. It will be worth it, to smash those bastards even just once. The old man's eyes bored into his. Again, he nodded. We'll begin when you're able. The week since they had attacked him stretched into months. Bass started to wonder if they had given up for good. Then, as he was walking home, three days before the Emperor's Day, Craven and his gang ambushed him from an alley and dragged him in. Bass lashed out immediately, without pausing for thought, and smashed one boy's nose to a pole. The boy yowled and broke from the fight, hands held up to his crimson smeared face. Craven shouted something, and the whole gang backed off forming a semicircle around their target. Bass watched as they all drew knives. If they expected him to piss his pants, however, they were gravely mistaken. Let's have it, all of you! Reaching into the waistband of his trousers, he pulled his own blade free. The Sarge didn't know about this. Bass hadn't told him now that he was carrying a weapon. He had found it on the tenanted stairwell one morning, a small kitchen knife stained with a stranger's blood. After washing it and sharpening it while the Sarge was at work, Baz had started to carry it with him. Now he was glad of it. It was his equalizer, though the odds he faced here were still far from equal. Craven didn't look so smug right then, but he motioned and the boys lunged in. Bass read their movements, just as the old man had taught him. The closest boy was going for a thrust to his midsection, Bass slipped it. His hands flashed out and cut the tendons in the boy's wrist. Screaming filled the alley, and the boy dropped to his knees, clutching his bleeding arm. Bass kicked him hard in the face. He roared at the others. Again, he kicked the wounded boy. This display was unlike anything the others were prepared for. They didn't want any of it. The gang broke. Boys bolted from the alley in both directions. Knives abandoned thrown to the ground. Only Crevin remained. He had never run from anything. If he ran now, he'd be giving up all his status, all his power, and he knew it. Even so, Bass could see it in his eyes. The terrorizer had become the terrified. Bass rounded on him, knife up, stance loose, light on his feet. Bass the bastard, said Bass, mimicking Craven's voice. You've no idea how right you were, you piece of filth. He closed in, angling himself for a lightning slash at the other boy's face. Something in Craven snapped. He dropped his knife and backed up against the alley wall, hands raised in desperate placation. Baz, please. It wasn't me. It was never me, honestly. Baz drew closer, ready to deliver a flurry of nasty cuts. He said never to tell you. He said he'd see us right, for money and low sticks. I swear it. Grog shit. 
Who? Who said that? He didn't believe Creven for a moment. The boy was just buying time, spinning desperate lies. The Sarge! Old Ironfoot! He came to us after the first time we beat you. Honest, I thought he was going to murder us, but he didn't. He said he wanted us to keep on you, keep beating you down. He told us to wait until you were healed each time. Bass halted his advance. That couldn't be true. No, but could it? Was the old man that twisted? Why would he do such a thing? Talk! He ordered Craven, urging him on with a mock thrust of his knife. That's it. Two days ago. He found us, and he told us to ambush you. He said to use knives this time. I told him he was crazy, no way. But he tripled the money he was offering. My old man, he's got lung rot. He can't work no more. I need the money, Baz. I didn't want to, but I had to. But it's over now, okay? Thrown above, it's over. Baz thought about that for a second, and then he rammed his right boot between Craven's legs. As the bully doubled over, Bass kicked him again, a blistering shot straight to the jaw. Yes, it is over. At home, he found the Sarge at the back of the tenement, leaning against the old dead tree, smoking a low stick in the sunlight. No medical kit this time? The Sarge grinned at him. I knew you wouldn't need it. You paid them to do it, didn't you? Said Bass. The old man exhaled a thick cloud of yellow smoke. You've done well, he told his grandson. It was all the confirmation he needed. Bass said nothing. He felt numb. Stay grounded, boy. Stay focused. We're just getting started, you and I. You think you've bested your demons, and maybe you have. For now. But there are worse things than childhood bullies out there. Never forget the fear and anger that brought you this far. Bass didn't answer. He stared at the dirt between his feet feeling utterly hollow, consumed by raw emptiness he hadn't known was possible. There's more to learn, boy. We're not done here. Remember the chubby runt you used to be. Think of how you've changed, what you've achieved. I gave you that. Keep training, boy. Keep learning. Don't stop now. As much as you hate me, you know I'm right. Let's see how far you can take it. If you want to stop, you know where the damn door is. I won't give bed and board to an emperor damned quitter. Bass looked at his hands. They were clenched into fists. His forearms rippled with taut muscle. He wanted to lash out at the Sarge, to bloody him. Maybe even kill him for what he had done. But, for all he'd changed, all he'd learned, his hands were still a child's hands. He was still only seven years old, and he had nowhere else to go. Besting other boys was one thing, but the old man was right about greater foes. Bass had seen big, barrel-chested men from the refineries beating their wives and children in the street. No one ever stopped them. No one dared, despite how sick it made them to turn away. Bass always wished he was big enough and tough enough to intervene. The impotence inherent in his age and stature angered him more than any daydreams of dispensing justice. However, he knew that training had brought focus and purpose to his life. His newfound strength, speed and skill had burned away that clinging shroud of fear he'd lived with for so long. Every technique he mastered brought him a fresh confidence his former weakness had always denied. He saw it, saw that he needed to keep growing, keep developing, to master every skill the old man offered and more. No, he didn't just need it, he wanted it. Right then and there, it was all he wanted. There was nothing else. He locked his eyes with his grandfather, his gaze boring into him with cold fire. All right, show me, teach me, I want all of it. A grin twisted the Sarge's scarred face. Good. Old Bale I, hero of Hades Hive, the old man, a name that even the angels of death respect, Commissar Sebastian Yarrick, 
a symbol of hope, piety and defiance, a legend, a rally cry to the people of Armageddon, a nightmare chanted in the foul Xenos tongue of the orcs across light years of space. He is ancient and looks every hour his age, but what has kept him alive is a mixture of minimal rejuvened chem surgeries, crude bionics, and a faith in the Emperor founded in hatred for the enemies of man. But who is the man behind the symbol? Who is the human underneath the mythology of old Bale Eye? His story begins in the 41st millennium, the Imperium of Mankind. For more than a hundred centuries, the Emperor of Mankind has sat immobile on the Golden Throne of Earth. He is the master of mankind, by the will of the gods and a master of a million worlds, by the might of his inexhaustible armies. To be a man in such times is to be one amongst untold billions. It is to live in the cruelest, most bloodiest regime imaginable. These are the tales of those times. Forget the power of technology and science, for so much has been forgotten, never to be relearned. Forget the promise of progress and understanding, for in the grim dark future there is only war. There is no peace amongst the stars, only an eternity of carnage and slaughter, and the laughter of thirsting gods. Upon the world of Teo III, a young boy was born into a life of luxury and comfort, but he would find his universe crashing down. His parents had been cold, distant even. They had loved him, he thought, but they were gone now. He knew a lie when he heard one, about a tragic accident at the planetary governor's summer mansion. All the assets that should have been his were seized for the Imperial War effort. The cousin of the governor himself, no less. In one moment, Bass had been the son of a wealthy investor, with mining concerns on a dozen mineral-rich moons. The next he was a seven-year-old orphan, stuffed into the smallest, filthiest compartment of a rusted train car. With nothing but a tide of cream-colored lice for company and a bag of clothes for a pillow, he cried that night, and for many more to come. Stepping off from the decrepit train, he stood before New Cadian Hive, an overpopulated, smog-filled, grimy hellscape, a sight he couldn't have even dreamed of before. Almost like an out-of-body experience, Bass stepped forward, his eyes meeting a shadowy figure that made his heart stop and his blood run cold. In the light he saw him, a scarred and mutilated face with hateful, dead eyes and an aura that spoke of a lifetime of battle and war. How could this be his grandfather, he thought, as tears rolled freely down his cheeks. What had he done to deserve this? Gone was the life of comfort and luxury, and in its place was the brutal and uncaring existence so common amongst the people of the Imperium of Man. Immediately they saw the weakness within him. The other children, Craven and his cronies made sure he never left the Skolem without a plethora of cuts and bruises. Each time he cried out in pain as his grandfather without grace patched and bandaged his wounds, seeing not even a look of sympathy across his ugly features. Bass felt alone. The beatings escalated. One had even drawn a blade. That night Bass limped home, through the decrepit streets of New Cadian, wounded and in pain, the people barely concerned, too distracted by their life of misery and poverty. Again, the old man bandaged him up, but this time Bass didn't cry. He looked the old man in the eyes and told him he knew what he was, what he had been. He had spoken to others. The old man snapped back at him, but Bass held his hateful gaze. You could teach me. You could help me, make me stronger, make it so I could kill them if I wanted to. The silence stretched on until the old man agreed. 
but it'll hurt more than anything you've endured so far. And there's no going back once we start, he told him. The privileged boy that had arrived was gone. Within months, it had been beaten out of him. The frustration, the desire to change his life had been ignited. The training was brutal, worse than the beatings by Craven and his cronies. But he saw the results. He enjoyed it. Again in a dark, cramp alley, Craven and his gang came upon him. This time they had all brought blades, but Bass was ready for them. He lunged at them, unleashing the rage that had built up since his parents' deaths. He smashed one boy's nose, cut another and screamed at them to try him. The boys fled in terror, leaving behind Craven to beg for mercy. It was not his fault. The old man had paid them to do it. Bass couldn't believe it. No, he could believe it. The old Sarge didn't really care. Ramming his foot into the crumpled craven, he marched home to confront the architect of his misery. You paid them to do it, didn't you? He spat at his grandfather. You've done well. The decrepit veteran returns to him. Stay grounded, boy. Stay focused. We are just getting started, you and I. You think you've bested your demons? And maybe you have, for now. But there are worse things than childhood bullies out there. Never forget the fear and anger that brought you this far. Oh, he hated him, the Sarge. But he was right. He had come so far in these months. The pain had been fuel. It forged and tempered him, and he liked it. He liked to look back and see how far he had come, how he had escaped his grief and loneliness, and had become strong. He wanted more. He wanted that look in his grandfather's eyes, the cold fire. He wanted it to be his own. For the first time in his life, Bass saw the old Sarge smile. Two and a half years of grueling training began. Combat, survival techniques, military drill, Anything the old veteran could teach, Bass absorbed. All until the day when seven black ships crossed directly overhead. Something was wrong. The old man knew it. The old Sarge cursed. It was only a matter of time, he muttered. He turned to Bass and gave him the closest thing to affection the boy had ever seen from him. And then he gave him a gift, telling him he had done his best. He had made him a survivor. He was the last of his blood, and he would make it. But war had come to Teo III, and the Imperial Guard never left one of its assets alone. Bass would never see his grandfather again. Finally alone, with no family in the universe, it wasn't long until the skies truly darkened, and shells and fire began to burn New Cadian Hive. The hellscape that had become his home was truly destroyed. The people, frightened and defenseless, were slaughtered as something foul began to rampage across Teos III. The training kicked in. Bass dived into the sewer system beneath the Hive City, surviving the destruction and death. Until finally he saw them. The hulking, barbaric monstrosities that had slaughtered everything in sight. Bulging muscles and fang protruding jaws that bellowed at a cry for war. The foul Xenos, the orcs, had come. Days, weeks, months began to pass for Bass, living like a scavenger in the corpse of the hive city. He had become a beast that skulked in the shadows, scavenging for scraps and supplies. True deep sleep felt like a memory, something he had once known. The short, nail-biting, dagger-clutch bursts of rest kept him sane, in spite of the nightmares of the life he had lost. Safety is an illusion, boy. Never forget that. Adrenaline is your ally, boy. Don't mistake it for fear. They're not the same thing. Weigh everything against your survival. He had almost died so many times he had lost count. Many foul Gretchen slain in booby traps and raw, ungraceful struggles as he stabbed them to death. 
He'd almost forgotten who he was, what it felt like to be human, until he saw them. Human slaves, dragged in cage by the laughing monstrous orcs that called these ruins home. Filthy and decrepit like him, their gaunt features haunting until he saw him, a boy. There was fire in his eyes. Even from this distance, Bass saw it. He felt it, defiance, and the will to live burned bright in this one. They were his eyes, his own soul staring back at him. A human connection that until now he did not know how desperately he craved it. He had to save him. He told himself he broke the survivor's code and set his path towards the cage, towards human connection. It would be his. He would not be alone. They killed him. Young Bass finally freed the boy from the cage. It was the dead of night. The foul orcs slumbered like beasts as he made his way stealthily through the camp. Their eyes met. The cold fire. The will to live. Someone who could understand him. A human connection. They were both filthy. Bass covered in old cuts, bruises and dirt. This boy in rags, disheveled, and with an imperial tattoo stamped upon his head. A voice spoke into Bass's mind. Cyric is my name. It caught Bass off guard. The boy opened his mouth and pointed inside. Most of his teeth were gone, and those that remained were little more than sharp, broken stubs. But this was not the reason the boy couldn't vocalize. Where his tongue should have been, only a dark nub of flesh remained. His tongue had been cut from his mouth. Bass didn't understand, but nor did he question it. It changed nothing. He would free him, and then he wouldn't have to be alone. Wrestling the key silently from an orc, Bass, with his little heart pounding, he turned the keys slowly. They were free. The desperate people scrambled, but the noise grew with the panic, drawing the attention of the greenskins. It was a massacre. The freed slaves scrambled over each other, only to inevitably fall to the slaughter. Bass gripped Cyric's hand, and they ran. They moved as fast as their small frames could carry, howling laughter and roars following in their wake. As they dashed through the alleys and rooftops, fire and death began to rain down next to them. Dark shapes once again clouded the sky as something began to assault the orcs. A shell punched through the roof they were standing on, and so Bass and Cyric tumbled into the dark. The two awoke to the dusty, damp tunnels that Bass had called home for the last months. He took Cyric's hand again, and they ran. He felt stronger. He felt his pain dull at the warmth of human touch. Did it make him weak? What would his grandfather have thought? With dust in their lungs, their clothes nothing but rags, their bodies malnourished and weak, they finally saw it. Moonlight. And it poured through a gap in the tunnel ceiling. An explosive shell had caused the rockcrete road above to collapse, forming a steep ramp. They heard human voices. They ran up to the light and smoke, only to hear yells and screams. The veils of smoke were suddenly pierced by a score of blinding, pencil-thin beams, all aimed at the two boys. They both went down. Bass began to tug Cyric's hand, but he didn't move. Dark blood began to pull the limp body, the only bond, the only person who could have been his friend. His only connection to his humanity was gone. Imperial Guard began to approach, only to find a child lunging at them, hate and pain in his eyes as he cried out for vengeance. A heavy hit knocked Bass to the ground, only for him to awaken, staring up at a man. He wore a black great coat and a peaked cap, and on that peak, a golden skull with eagle's wings gleamed. 
He saw his eyes. They were the same steel he had known in the old Sarge. A commissar who saw the markings of survival on this young boy. Orc feces smothered on his skin. The supplies, the old knife he carried. He saw the look in his eyes. He was smart, this one. He asked for his name, and the boy hesitated. He almost said Varden, his family name. But then he looked upon the acid-etched blade his grandfather had gifted him, the last time they had seen each other. No, he was Bass, short for Sebastian. He was Sebastian Yarrick. The boy from Teos III was taken from his ravaged homeworld. What could have been a life of privilege had become one of survival and grit. Sebastian Varden had died long ago, replaced by the being with the potential to serve the Imperium. A boy with a name that blazed across his soul, one in homage to the old Sars that had forged and tempered him, Yarrick. The Scholar Progenium, the finest education the Imperium had to offer to orphans' children, candidates who had no crutches such as family or friends, children whose only loyalty would be to the Imperium and the God Emperor of mankind. The young Yarrick, in the cramp, smog-filled hell of New Cadian Hive, had shown his inner fire. He had seen it, seen that he needed to keep growing, keep developing, to master every skill the old man offered, and more. And what was offered now was that path, strength, improvement, duty, and service to the God Emperor of mankind. His training began. Military exercises, weapons proficiency, hand-to-hand -hand combat. Knowledge was poured into him, crafting him into the perfect soldier. But it wasn't enough. Bodies fail, grow old and weak. But the one strength that could never fail was the mind. The Imperial Creed, the divine mandate of the Imperium, and worship of the God Emperor was absolute. Day and night, it was beaten into the growing Yarrick, his faith growing, forged into an impenetrable armor that would defend against the mutant and heretic, the backbone of the role that he had to play. The Commissar, the political officer, one tasked with the duty of upholding morale and the Imperial Creed throughout the billion serving in the Imperium's guard. Yarrick had to become unbreakable, an inspiration of zeal and hate, a symbol that men and women would respect and in equal parts fear, and to forge a person like that. They had to be pushed to the point of nearly breaking ready to be built back up into an impenetrable fortress. Many young children would never survive this process, the very path itself structured to weed out the weak in body and soul. He had made many enemies in this time of education, as well as friends such as Dominic Serov. But most importantly, he learned about the mind of his future charges, his allies, the enemies of the Imperium, the mutant, the heretic, and Xenos. Even learning the orc language from a human raider who had once been a prisoner of the Greenskins. A particular hatred of the orcs could never quite leave him. Yarrick had arrived a boy, but after years of training he became a man, Commissar Sebastian Yarrick. Immediately he was sent to his new home, war. At the front lines of the Imperium, serving in over a dozen war zones and with regiments from Necromunda and Luther McIntyre, fire and blood was common for the young Commissar, gaining the experience he needed. Until finally, at the end of the 41st millennium, Yarrick descended down towards the world of Mistral, a planet in the firm, unforgiving grip of the Imperial Ecclesiarchy. The deployment of the Mortician infantry rushed before him as he stood side by side with his friend, Commissar Dominic Serov, and their mentor, Lord Commissar Simeon Rasp. The admiration the two had for their lord was apparent. Observe, 
and learn. The words were drilled into Yarrick's head. Now had come the time where he put down the rifle. His words, his sharp black uniform, and fear-inducing presence had to become his weapon. A weapon that would be sharpened under the eyes of Lord Commissar Rasp in the coming war on Mistral. It was a rebellion, a war that would change Yarrick forever. You are both missing an essential element. If I were to lose even one of my fingers, I could still fire the weapon, but my accuracy and my speed would be compromised. Lose the thumb or forefinger, and I will be hard pressed to do more than simply hold the gun. His eyes, a cold blue so pale they were almost white, flickered over each of us in turn, judging whether his instruction was sinking in. Am I making myself clear? The collective strength is created by that of individuals, Seroff said. Ignore the importance of specific positions at your peril. I added. Rasp returned the pistol to his belt. Quite so. It falls to us, to you, to preserve the health of the whole by ensuring the proper functioning of the part. And should the finger be gangrenous, sever it and take its place. Rasp gave a single nod. The lesson was over. We listened to the rest of Granite's speech. He had moved on from broad considerations of regimental honor to the specifics of the mission. Or at least, he had pretended to do so. What he said was little different from any number of commanding officers, exhortations I had heard, back when I had been one of the thousands on the embarkation deck. Granite struck me as working from a script, one he had trotted out many times before. He spoke with energy and enthusiasm, but his delivery was over-rehearsed. The more I watched him, the more I saw a man discharging a difficult but necessary duty, one he would be happy to see over and done. Rasp grunted. Gentlemen, I hope you're noting the Colonel's oratory. I have the greatest respect for his tactical prowess, but he is no rhetorician. What, in your estimation, is the problem here? Too familiar. A thin smile from the Lord Commissar. Precisely. How many times have you both heard the same vague thoughts, assembled with very similar words? Seroff shrugged. Isn't it all an inevitable but necessary ritual? A single shake of the head, as precise and emphatic as the one not earlier. Yes. But the address should never be ritualized. Its truth becomes robbed of urgency. It fails to inspire. Have you read the Legamemnon Victoriae of Lord Commander Solar Macarius? I had. Seroff hadn't. He tried to bluff by looking very focused and interested, as if he were comparing a Macarian address to Granite's current effort and would come up with a cogent answer in another few moments. Rasp wasn't fooled. Correct that lacuna, Commissar Seroff. You will see the true art of the military speech. Read but one address, and you will be already well launched on a new crusade. When you stand before warriors, you must inspire them. I know, as do you, that too many of those soldiers are whether they know it themselves or not, politely waiting for Colonel Granich to finish so they can get on with it. That is not how it should be. He favoured first Seroff, and then me with a hard look. That is how it must never be when you speak. Your authority will inspire fear in the troops who fall under your eye. This is right and necessary, but it is not enough. The mere sight of you must grant them fire, and when they hear you, they must be happy to give up their lives. He paused. At great cost to the enemy, of course. Of course. I agreed. Rasp listened to Granach a few moments more, then grimaced. Word for word. These generalities are death. Except in cases of necessary secrecy, Tell these loyal servants of the Emperor why they are about to kill and die. Let them know the stakes. Give them a sense of purpose. Tell them 
why we are here. You heard General Rallum's address to the commanding officers. His style is rather too clipped, but he was precise. Commissar Yarrick, tell me why we are here. We have come at the request of Cardinal Wangenheim to suppress a heretical uprising led by Baron Bartholomew Lom of Mistral. A snort. True, but rather bluntly put. If you were speaking to your charges, you would find more of the poetry of war in your soul, I trust. I once heard you when I visited the Scholar Progenium, Yarrick. I know what you are capable of, but yes, we have come to quell the turbulent Baron Lom. Rasp looked up away from the assembly. His gaze drifted to the outer hall doors. He seemed to be staring through them, as if he could see Mr. Arl turning below. Lord Commissar? Seroth asked, no answer at first. There was a faint tightening of his jaw, the only sign of an internal debate. Finally, he said, You are political officers, you know this, but I wonder if you have grasped the full implications of that fact. Your duties are to guard against deviation. The realities will mean rather more. Necessity will drive you to swim in murky waters. He fell silent. He hadn't disclosed anything truly revelatory. He had articulated that which was never said, but understood by all but the most naive. There was something else he was on the verge of saying. I hesitated before speaking, but as the seconds mounted into silence, I realized that moment was slipping away. I decided to be direct. No, that was a lie. I didn't decide. I have always been direct. That is my special curse. It is also, I know, why I have been seen as a curse myself. That's a thought to keep me warm at night. Are the waters of Mistral murky? I asked. Ras made a noise in his throat. A stillborn laugh. So the local expression would have it. It's been years since I last set foot on its surface, but I would be surprised if matters have changed for the better since then. They can't have. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. True. And yet... Rasp frowned. He thought for a moment, and then his expression cleared. He had come down on one side of a hard deliberation, and was now at peace with his conscience. Gentlemen... This mission appears to be very straightforward. An insurgency that is beyond the abilities of local forces to contain, but that is nevertheless limited in scope. Our rapid triumph is a certain conclusion, and is therefore not to be trusted. When matters are at their most cut and dry, it is when you must be most weary. On Mistral? Anywhere. Everywhere. But today, yes, on Mistral. I ran through the questions in my mind, examined angles. I applied the lessons of my mentor, assumed the hand of political maneuvering, even and especially where none seems present. What was the context lurking behind this rebellion? Why would Ras be uneasy? He had been here before. That was an interesting piece of data. What did that tell me then? A possibility dawned. Is Baron Lom known to you? I asked. The corner of Raf's mouth twitched. He was pleased. Not just with his student, I think, but also with the opportunity to speak further. I've met him twice, and then only briefly. But I was impressed. The family has a storied history of service in the Imperial Guard. I believe that certain offshoots have even produced some Inquisitors. He had continued to stare at the far wall as he spoke. But now he finally faced us, and there was the hard, unflinching, evaluating gaze. It was perhaps the most visible expression of the qualities that had made him preeminent among commissars. Nothing escaped those eyes. Nothing was beyond their judgment. When I was pinned by that gaze, I knew to listen to the next words as though my soul depended upon them. Heresy has no respect for reputation or family. I have seen it take root in the heart of individuals who had, until that very moment, been so free of taint as to be saints. No one is beyond its reach except the Emperor himself. No one. So would I not suggest for a second that Baron Lom 
is somehow above suspicion. But, but, the same fact remains that Lom's profile is not the usual one for a heretic, and the political waters of Mistral are of the very murkiest. So, fellow commissars, my final command before we head into battle. Eyes open, always. Every soldier is a politician to some degree. The higher the rank, the greater the degree. But only the commissars specifically tasked with those concerns. If you think that your role is simply a guardian of orthodoxy, then you are a fool. Observe and learn to inspire in equal parts hope and dread to the men and women under their command, they had to observe, dissect a person, their personality, their beliefs, the way in which they move in the world. Learn. Learn to evaluate how to reach them. Where one requires patience and understanding, others may need dominance and fear. That was the role of the Commissar, to be the bastion of morale and faith and then finding a way to inject that zealotry into thousands. The lessons of Rast bore into Yarrick. He knew how to be a good soldier, but did he know how to be a symbol? Yarrick adored the man, and in turn the Lord Commissar saw something special within Yarrick. A deep seriousness that would either make or break him. Actions and consequence the nuance of power Yarrick had been given, one he didn't think he would have to use so quickly, as he and the Mortician Guard regiments prepared for battle. The rebel position was poor, but Yarrick and his men were on the offensive. Like a wave of las fire and meat, the two forces clashed, Yarrick screaming cries for the Emperor as their guns overheated. Yarrick, slashing and maiming with his saber with all the hate and piety his emperor given will could muster. The rebels fled as the victory chants cried into the air until they saw it. Walking out of the gates of the rebels' bastion, a titan rumbled the ground around them. Icons of corruption and death decorated its monstrous form, symbols only Yarrick knew the truth of. Yarrick rallied, charging the Mortisians upon the beast. Fire and destruction rained upon their target, as plasma beams and munitions tore the men apart at Yarrick's side. Finally, the monstrosity began to fall, but in its death throes it let out a mournful, sorrowful screech that would haunt Yarrick forever. His blood ran cold, as if the soul of his being had been wounded. He wanted to block it out, but observe and learn. No, he couldn't turn away. It was his duty to bear witness, to understand his enemy, so that he could better face it. As the wailful cry of madness died out, Yarrick, Rasp and Serof strode across the victorious bloody battlefield. The heart and truth of this rebellion lie within their encampment. A corruption that had to be snuffed out. It was there, hidden within the previous wealthy estate of the rebel lord, Baron Long, that they found something dark and twisted. A sight that scraped at the corners of their sanity. A sacrificial altar, covered in decayed gore and innocent blood. Even as Yarrick observed and learnt, he felt sick to his stomach. Yarrick, Rasp, and Seroth knew what this was. Chaos. The great enemy had found its way into the heart of Mistral, a toxic ingredient to the already volatile situation. The world itself was already upon the nice edge. A planet upon the brink of war between the noble families and Wagenheim of the Ecclesiarchy, and now with the added eyes of the Inquisition. Yarrick felt out of place in the heart of the ecclesiarchal palaces at the capital of Minstral. 
the wealth he had been born into was nothing compared to the almost grotesque displays of wealth and power here in these golden halls. The sight of Wagenheim disgusted Yarek almost instantly. His over-bloated frame, his smug face, his very tone that all stunk of someone utterly unworthy of their position. But he knew his duty, so Yarek swallowed the distaste. He played the part of awed young officer as the corruption of the Imperium swam around him. This was not his battle, but something else quickly called his attention. Yarek stormed into the Mortisian's camp, furious as he stepped into the command tent. An Inquisitor, Hector Kraus stood at the center. Slumped upon a stool was Yarek's man, Betzner, the one who had crippled the Titan Walker, leading to his destruction. He was bloodied, and surrounded by an array of sharp tools beside him. Kraus was a blunt, paranoid thing that dripped with contentment for the lesser being who were his fellow mortal men. The Inquisitor, with arrogance dancing on his voice, dismissed him instantly, but Yarek cut back with an attitude so brazen it caught Kraus off guard, like he had never been challenged before. Kraus was not the only one wearing a uniform that invoked fear. Observe and learn. Yarek was under no impression that he could be slain on a whim, but even he would not tolerate the blatant abuse of his men where no suspicion had justified it. Every soldier is a politician to some degree. The higher the rank, the greater the degree. He observed Kraus, evaluated his nature, saw the all-consuming desire for answers and the act he would take to get them. Yarek chose his words carefully, taking his cruelty and replacing it with inefficiency. He wanted to find this cult of chaos, but why waste his time on methods that would not achieve the information he desired? He would watch Betzner. The information will come in time, and then together they would purge this threat. Information at hand, without the cost of Betzner and a demoralized force. Yarek had put his life on the line. It was simply not enough to observe. Now he had to learn if he had made the right call. Again to the capital, Yarek, Seroff and Rasp arrived. To the conclave of Barons and Vargaheim, the power play and politics were like an unspoken truth that bled from the room, much to the disgust of Yarek. The power play to crush the Barons under the disgusting heel of Vargaheim was leading to war. He was corrupt despite his faith in the Emperor being genuine, even if it felt perverted to Yarek. The Commissars and Barons bore witness to the next play of this planet's ruler, a holy relic, one guarded by Sisters of Battle, will be paraded throughout the city, another display of power, an antagonization of the Barons of Mistral. It was a powder keg waiting to blow, thought Yarek as he began to inspect the streets of the city. The barons were bound to act, and the incoming reports of kidnapping had flared their concerns with the Chaos Cult, still at large. Along the streets of the city, Yarrick and the Morticians marched. The fervent cheers of the people screamed into the air, as the bloated grubby fingers of Vargaheim held aloft the broken bones of Saint Calixtus. Hymns and chants blared as the Sisters of Battle glared from the sides of this clearly political display. And then the square erupted. A concussive boom tore its way from underground and rippled through Yarek's bones. Fire, rubble, and splinters exploded into the air, cascading down upon them all. The panic began immediately. The frightened people began to run a disorganized wave of clawing and trampling beasts. A warning shot into the air did nothing to alleviate this panic. Soon the Morticians would be trampled themselves. The security of the city and the Holy Relic was at the edge of failure, and so the Morticians began to fire. Lasbeans began to mow down the panicked hordes of the faithful of Minstral, 
until order was reinstated. Yarrick and Seraph barked their discipline across the lines of the Morticians, even as innocent blood flecked upon their pristine uniforms. The attack had come from underground, the sewers, something that would have taken months to orchestrate. Booms could be heard in the distance, artillery. The capital was under attack. From outside the walls, a mob of corrupted, mal-twisted people had begun a large-scale assault. For the various sewer entrances, small groups of scarred and bloodied men and women chanting in foul tongues and decorating icons of chaos streamed. Observe and learn, rung in Yarrick's mind. Assess the battlefield, his resources and men. Secure the city first, and then learn their enemy's objective and how to crush them. Orders bellowed out from Yarrick, leading contingents of the Mortisians, the Imperials began to fan out across the city, Yarrick becoming the cohesive glue to bind the forces of the Imperium together. They began eliminating the forces of chaos that rose up from under their feet. In the dark, murky sewers and the war-torn streets, Yarrick and his men fell upon them. To me, he roared as he led them from the front. The only way forward is through the blood of traitors and heretics. The rhetoric became a rally cry as the Imperials gritted their teeth in the face of Sajid's generosy. He was not just a soldier. He was a political officer. His duty was to inspire, equal past disciplinarian and preacher. If you think that your role is simply a guardian of the orthodoxy, then you are a fool. He had to be the image, the incorruptible, fearless, inspiring. He had to be a symbol. The shells came down around them. Blood poured from his ears as Yarek stumbled amongst the dust and fire. Be the symbol, the word screamed in his foggy mind. Yarek stood, rising above his allies. On the rubble, a silhouette of a man appeared. It was defiant, arrogant in the face of death. A sense of exhilarating freedom shivered through Yarek's veins as he pointed to the sky, and with a throat-tearing bellow, he screamed, Is that the best our enemy can do? Does he think this will make us bend our knee? The heretics can do nothing against us. Shielded by our faith, we are invincible. He will hurl himself against the walls, and what will he find there? Death. The chance of death. Death began to rise. A choir of beating hearts for the Emperor. Throughout the city they ran, Yarek's fervor an example like a wave, carrying the Mortisians through the artillery and fire, like men possessed. He kept on screaming, chanting, loosing off words of encouragement, until his voice was hoarse, even to the point where he lost cohesive thought. Still, zealotry and hate poured out from his subconsciousness, the mind of a man whose faith in the Emperor was absolute. Yarrick, Colonel Benninger, and their men regrouped with Seroff and Inquisitor Kraus, who had nearly been swarmed by cultists. The two forces slammed into each other, a wall of las fire and blade hacked at each other, Yarrick almost feeling like he was drowning in flesh. But the fervor of the Imperials was greater, their Yarrick-inspired hate was greater. They pushed their enemies back until they heard the rumble of an engine. A monster exploded out from a tunnel, an unholy creation, a hellish meshing of a basilisk tank and a walker mount. Dark symbols and blood covered its surface. To gaze upon them, it felt like your soul was sick. Men and women were crushed and torn apart in its wake as it rampaged through the tight streets. Yarek ran, Starting into a house just in time, his heart roaring as he made his way towards the rooftops. 
The monstrosity was rampaging, but before Yara could think of a counterattack, he heard those words. I'm going to order a retreat, Colonel Benninger muttered, unable to tear his twitching eyes from the symbols on the construct. Yarek stood before him, even as he spilled forth unrelenting words of cowardice before a commissar. Issue new orders now, Yarek said, his voice stern but not angry, his body tensed as he knew what was coming what was going to be demanded of him. Their eyes met, and in that moment Yarrick knew the colonel had been lost. A man who had served with distinction for decades, a good soldier, a sound colonel, but still just a man, vulnerable to chaos. Yarrick raised his pistol and fired. The body slumped to the floor, as Yarrick took his first Imperial life. A duty he knew he would have to repeat a thousand more times in the years to come. Now came his duty to ensure the Colonel's death had meaning. Yarrick looked around, his gaze swept over his men, declaring that he was taking command. We do not retreat, relay the news. Yarrick and his men rallied, grabbing demolition charges and launches. They began to bombard the monstrosity to oblivion. It was a gamble, but it paid off. A weak spot opened up before him as Yarrick threw the demolition charge within. Two explosions rocked the buildings around them as the construct erupted into flame and twisted metal. The cultists began to run their fear of this madman greater than their love for chaos. A valuable lesson Yarrick thought, to be a symbol for his enemies too. Yarrick and the Morticians had been bled, but the enemy had suffered more. The bodies of guard, cultist, and civilian lay strewn across the streets, but still the Imperials moved on. Yarrick, exhausted beyond belief as they made their way towards the walls, the city had been secured for now, but Lord Commissar Rasp was missing. Thousands of civilians and guard were dead, whilst Vargaheim hid in his palace, guarded by the deeply unimpressed Sisters of Battle. The Cardinal was clearly out of his depth, and Inquisitor Kraus was somewhere in the shadows, so the defence fell to Yarrick, Seroth, and the surviving colonels more burdens upon his shoulders. But their rest did not last as the night came. Throngs of heretics began their assault. White flares soared into the night sky, illuminating the field in a pseudo-sun. Again Yarrick preached across the lines, inspiring them, filling them with zeal and hate, ridiculing the enemy that dared to hope take these walls. The heretics began their climb into a wall of Laz fire. Thousands upon thousands clashed in the fumbling darkness. Bolter and flame the only illumination into the nightmare of war. Yarrick felt his blood sing with heat. His chants never stopped as the blood and smoke filled the air for hours upon hours. It was only when dawn came that the heretics had finally had their fill of throwing men and women into the meat grinder. Exhaustion reigned on both sides. Yarrick stood before Vargaheim, Kraus and the lead sister Sethino. Even now all could see Vargaheim try to make political moves, his cowardice evident. Much to the disgust and disdain of all those around him, they were in a stalemate. The Baron supported Chaos Cult, couldn't break into the city, but the Imperials couldn't break out, and their resources were running low. Yarrick and Kraus left, still arguing. The Inquisitor's interrogations of the civilians had begun to spread panic throughout the city. It seems both roles had very different interpretations of observe and learn, but their arguments were interrupted. Something drew them back to the palace. A premonition from Betzner, the man who had caught the Inquisitor's eye before. In the crits below, Yarrick felt it. A toxic sensation. Existential dread building in waves. 
from a tunnel entrance, an explosion rocked the chamber. Splinters and flakes of burning parchment filled the air as a stream of cultists rushed forth. Yarrick and Kraus turned to see something grotesque, larger than a man with glistening pink skin, multi-limbed and with a gaping jaw. Looking upon it, Yarrick's mind ached and his stomach dropped as for the first time in his life, he saw a demon. The words used in his training were a poor representation of this utter abomination, sentient nightmare manifest. No matter how long he lived, the damage to his psyche would always remain. Yarrick and Kraus rose as one, retreating their minds into a place of safety. They leapt at the abomination. It bled, and that meant they could kill it. Cultus and guard began to fall around them, gutted and devoured in a mosh pit of cleaver, lasfire and claw. The duel with insanity itself was brutal. Yarrick pushed to the edge of his abilities as he and Kraus broke it apart, only for it to convulse and split. One gaping more became two as the demon multiplied. The smaller, blue Horus launched at the surviving Imperials tearing men and women into ribbons of flesh. Yarrick, with his bolt gun empty, his sword slick with demon blood, was almost overwhelmed, until a chorus of bolt guns sang. The sisters of battle stormed into the crypt. He felt their zeal, their purity of faith sing from them, and he felt humbled. Sister Sethino and her sisters unleashed fire and death banishing the demon back into the warp. Wounded and exhausted, even in his soul, Commissar Yarrick stood, victorious against the enemy's strike towards their leadership. The situation had changed. This cult had progressed, and now the warp itself had entered the battlefield. Yarrick had observed and learned. Perhaps the enemy's strategy of a direct strike at the leadership was something that they could employ. An idea crystallized in Yarrick's head, and for the rare occasion that it was, he found himself smiling. With Seroth, Kraus, Sethino, and the Mortisians at his side, he would end this uprising at its heart. He would cut off its head. What is will but the strength of faith? What gives faith its strength if it is not will? Become faith, become will, for the god emperor of mankind. Marsek stepped back out of the shadows. I joined him. We stared down into the tunnels. There was still movement down there, still the alien sounds. For the moment, at least, they weren't moving upward. Marsek whispered, What's down there? Something we're not equipped to fight, Captain, but we can report its existence. Green. Moving quietly, limiting himself to hand gestures alone, Marsek signaled our withdrawal. We maintained silence for the first two levels, when it became clear that the pyramid's denizens weren't following, and that the last of our enemies had gone down to their annihilation. Verston went back to work with the Vox, trying to raise the scattered elements of Sixth Company. Marsek called him up to the front with us. Anything? No answer from Sergeant Hanasek, sir. But I received a transmission from Sergeant Brenkin on the Castell in Belasco. She and some armsmen have freed themselves and are fighting back. She says that the occupying force is small. The traitor space marines were the ones who captured our ship and they left behind only a minimal group of cultists. They're armed, of course, but... But it wouldn't take much to dislodge them. That's what she thinks, Commissar, yes. I gave Marsek a significant look. Our Valkyries, some distance from the ridge, should still be intact. Even with our numbers reduced to not much more than two squads worth, we could retake the ship. We'll link up with Sergeant Hanasek. With our company reunited, we shall purge the scum from our decks. Marsek said. I frowned. He was assuming that Hanasek's contingent still existed. 
Two Reavers had come after us, unless some were mounting guard outside the pyramids, which seemed unlikely. That meant the other three were pursuing Hanozek and his troops. Those were formidable odds. Marsek was basing his strategy on an assumption for which he had no evidence. I was uneasy, but decided to say nothing until we reached the surface. As we were climbing out of the crater, Verston managed to get through to Hanozek's Vox operator. For a few seconds, the other fragment of Sith company was being pressed, hard, and driven deeper into the pyramid. There was no question of their being able to set up an ambush. The heretics and reavers were upon them. They could not break off. Send a message that help is coming. Belay that, trooper. I told Verston. To Marsic, I said. Captain, a word. I expected him to be furious at my intervention. Instead, he seemed eager to talk as if it was important to him that he bring me about to his perspective. We left the troops at the lip of the crater and moved down the slope a short distance to speak behind a rounded heap of congealed slag. We cannot rescue them. We have to try. No, we are duty bound not to. Such an attempt would be doomed. You know that as well as I do. We would then be leaving a frigate of the Imperial Navy in enemy hands. That would be an unforgivable failure. I have already failed my troops once this day. I won't do it again. You will if you follow this course. They will all die. I have to try. I looked at him steadily. He did not blink. He knew exactly what he was saying. He knew the consequences. His ego had led us to this pass. He understood this and sought redemption. But we didn't have the luxury for redemption. We needed victory. Before me stood a good man, but the Imperium needed him to be something more, though. It needed him to be a good officer. Instead, he was the ruin of one. He was, in this moment of crisis, proving himself unable to truly make the hard decision. He was throwing that responsibility onto me. I cannot allow you to jeopardize this mission. No. No, you can't. But you cannot make me abandon my troops. I pulled my pistol from its holster. Marsic gave me a sad smile. He got down on his knees. Do what is necessary, Commissar Yarrick. Why are you forcing my hand? Stop me. Or let me do what I must. I put the muzzle of the pistol against his forehead. He closed his eyes. Peace suffused his features. I felt a grimace contort mine. I knew that what I was doing was correct. I have had to use this ultimate sanction against officers more often than I care to count. Each instance is a tragedy, a necessity whose causes are so unnecessary. But never before or since have I encountered a soldier who accepted my judgement with such grace. I hope I never will again. The hard decision was mine as was the harder action. Silently, I cursed Marsek for this moment that I would have to live with for all the years to come. I curse him still. He was, even then, still not fully honest with either of us. He was seeking a martyr's end as redemption for his failure. In this way, he turned away from the hard decision. He made it mine instead. Mine, the choice and mine the even harder action. So be it. I pulled the trigger. I marched back to the company. A horrified silence had fallen over it. We make for the landing site. We are retaking the Castellan Belasco. I didn't mind the gazes, whether averted or hostile. They couldn't add to the burden I was already carrying, or to the further weight I was about to shoulder. Get Hanoshek. Don't stop trying until you do. We had reached the base of the slope when Verson passed me the handset. It was hard to make out what Hanazek was saying. His words kept being cut off by what sounded like static, but I knew to be weapons fire. He was asking for help. Sergeant, this is Yarek. We cannot provide assistance. The ship is being held. That is the key to this mission's success. Do you understand? More explosions and cries in the background. Then... Yes. Is there any way you can bypass the enemy? No. 
We've already lost half our strength. They're backing us down a tunnel. Commissar, there's movement down there. I closed my eyes for a moment, hating what I was about to say. Sergeant, go deeper. Head towards that movement. Another pause. I didn't think it was only due to the fighting. Commissar? What is down there will kill the enemy. Sixth Company will be victorious. Do you understand? There was no pause this time. I do. The Imperium thanks you, Sergeant Hanashek. This is simply our duty, sir. He would have made a fine officer. I will remain on the Vox. All the way. Thank you. We had no more exchanges after that. He left the channel open. I heard the sounds of the end. I kept my promise and stayed present, bearing what witness I could. I was there as we reached the landing site and boarded the Valkyries. Hanozek and his portion of the Sixth fought well and hard, as long as they could, luring the enemy to the disaster. The fighting was still going on as we reached the frigate, and the immoral, leaderless rabble that occupied the bridge was confronted with the anger of the Steel Legion. I was barely aware of our victory on the ship. All of my attention was focused on the terrible victory inside the pyramid, on Ionos. I was there to hear Hanozek, in mortal fear but still fighting, cry, Throne, what are they? He would receive no answer, none of us for many years to come, years of blessed ignorance. But on that day, I still sought the pain of knowledge. I forced myself to learn the cost of my decision. I listened to the transmission until the sounds of battle ceased. I listened for almost an hour after that. I listened as the reclaimed Castilian Balasco prepared to leave the system. I listened to the hollow, hissing remains of the hard choices. It was the most horrifying thing he had ever seen. Just like his grandfather had said, there are worse things than childhood bullies, or even orcs. Yarrick ran towards the dais, flanked by Seroth, Sethano, and her sisters, Kraus, and a crack squad of the brave Mortisians. To the corrupted Baron's Mountains fortress the Imperials had trudged, the journey costing thousands of lives. Entering the disgusting citadel, passing chained victims, too far gone to save, War slick with blood, and desecrated with symbols of chaos. They saw it. The barons, and a swarm of cultists, and dreaded demons. The Imperials charged. Laz and Bolter rounds rammed into the heretics, as Yarrick pushed forward. On an iron chair sat the mutilated, tortured form of his mentor, Lord Commissar Rasp, almost unrecognizably broken. The Baron Varsin, the architect of this uprising, linked hands with the other barons. They began to chant from a cursed book, maddening foul expletives ringing in Yarrick's ears as he made to strike. But he wasn't close enough. The traitor barons began to twist and melt, the flesh and bone molding into one enlarged monstrosity, a violating act Yarrick witnessed. At such a close proximity, he would never forget that sight in sickening detail. The Varsin mutant began lashing out. Seroth and Kraus were smashed to the ground as Yarek leapt onto the beast's back. With the fury of the Emperor himself, he rammed his sword into the beast's skull and began to twist. But it was no final victory. It was the last body piled upon thousands that had already been sacrificed. Reality itself tore open, rippling the dais with corrupted lightning. Yarrick's mind recoiled as pieces of concepts and snarling abstractions whirled past, and then it coalesced. A sickly pink-skinned, flesh-rippling, horned demon draped in finery and things human language failed to describe, stepped forth. A greater demon of the foul god Zinch had entered reality. Gal Shanhar. Gal Shanhar, they screamed. Even its name wounded the soul. It was Rasp's howling scream that broke Yarrick back into action. 
the Lord Commissar was locked within the demon's grip, and he screamed as if tortured in his very psyche. The warp leaked around Yarrick and the Imperials, almost like fighting with a kaleidoscope of nightmare. Yarrick himself began to understand why Rasp had screamed as he made contact with the demon. Flashes of the past and future touched his mind, something his Emperor-given strength tried desperately not to look at, not to let corrupt him. Armageddon, a great enemy, searing pain in his left eye and right arm. Faith, will, the Emperor, Yarrick screamed in his mind. What is will but the strength of faith? What gives faith its strength, if not will? Become faith, become will, for the God Emperor of mankind. More Imperials fell in horrifying ways, until finally Sister Sethano lunged forward as Yarrick struck the demonic book Vasahin had used before, and again at the altar behind it. The wharf began to rush around them as Yarrick stood defiantly. Be the symbol. His body and mind was at the point of breaking, but still he stood, the survivor boy from Teos III. The living rallied and pummeled the collapsing demon with everything they had, pushing it back into the Immaterium. Victory on Mistral was theirs, though it had cost oceans of blood. The guard and people, victims of chaos, and the politics of those at the top. Yarrick, wounded, both in body and spirit prayed in a chapel alone. Mistral had taught him much, those murky waters where one could still be corrupt and serve the Emperor. The need to be the symbol, where Rasp had been captured and the cowardice of others reigned. Sister Sethano approached him, in this place of quiet and healing. They had both been changed on a fundamental level. No one, in such close proximity to the machinations of the warp, ever leaves unscathed. In gazing into an abyss, the abyss had looked back into them, where Sethano had been expunged of the tapestry of greater human emotion. Yarrick had been propelled as if his zeal and hate for his enemies had only grown. He burned brighter. He knew he should not believe the vision that had scraped his mind, the sickly gift of the demon's contact. But the image of a hulking form troubled him. His right arm and eye would forever remain sore. Lord Commissar Rasp broke, Sethano said. You must kill him. Fury touched Yarrick's heart. No, he did not hear his mutilated mentor repent the Emperor. He would give him a chance. He deserved that. There Yarrick prayed more as Sethano left. Finally he left to his mentor's side in the medical tent, dreading the choice he knew in his heart he would have to make. There is a difference between thinking like a commissar and acting like one. Rasp had told him long ago. The Lord Commissar had served for lifetimes. He had seen thousands die, and more wars than Yarrick had been alive for. But he had been broken, subjected to a suffering most could never even dream of. Once again in Yarrick's life, he lost a mentor, as he sent Lord Commissar Rasp to the Emperor's side. Another burden he accepted, even as it broke the decades-long friendship with Dominic Serov. Never again would the two meet on friendly terms. But war never ends for the political officer of the guard. As Yarrick left the silhouette of Minstral in his wake, he was reassigned to his new station, the Armageddon Steel Legion. Night had fallen on Ionis, shrouded by the enormous gas giant, Kalasima. It had not been long since the trial of fire that was Mistral and its murky waters. In fortified trenches, Yarrick and his newly assigned regiment stared across at the enemy's position, a foul cult of the Dark Gaunts. Sergeant Hanozek stood by his side as the two turned back to their own men. Observe and learn, 
the lesson he was now enacting as he saw Captain Jaron Marsek. He was handsome and charismatic. The men looked up to him like a symbol, Yarek thought, but something bugged him. The role of Commissar required him to read people, and what he saw beneath the Machiavellian facade was an almost childlike flippancy. Marsek's confidence was the immortality of a young man, something that was fragile in the battles to come. Captain Marsek ordered a charge. Finally, the Imperials would dig out the nest of rats. The roars followed Marsek right into a trap. Yarrick cursed himself as the shells began to rain down on them. Like little insects trampled under a boot of flame, Marsek and Yarrick's men were decimated. And when the dust settled, Yarrick saw his face, Marsek's horror and hollowness. He was functioning, but Yarrick noted his fallacy. As the survivors gathered again, they were attacked, forcing them to retreat into these ancient, buried Xenos tombs that peeked out from the sand. They darted in as the forces of chaos were at their heels. The sleek corridors and pyramids sent shivers down Yarrick's spine. It screamed danger, but still they pushed further. But now it was their turn, as Yarrick, Marsek, and their men set their own ambush, leading traps for the advancing forces of chaos. In the dim green light, with Laz and Bolter roaring as they cried out for the Emperor, they fought a brutal, up-close war. But it was a losing battle. Men and women dropped like flies, until they retreated back into an eerie mist. Hiding at the sides, their pursuers darted past into the sightless screaming depths. Their screams were haunting, but what lay below was a problem for another day, as the survivors ran for their lives, back towards the surface. The situation was dire. The fleet in orbit had been boarded. The priority was obvious until Yarrick heard those words. We'll link up with Sergeant Hanozik. Send a message that help is coming. We are duty bound not to, Yarrick replied. Such an attempt would be doomed. You know that as well as I do. But Captain Marsek protested. Yarrick felt the slight dread begin to rise as he knew what was coming. He cursed Marsek for this moment that would be with him for all his years to come. He saw through him. The captain was seeking a martyr's end, as a redemption for his failure, hoping to wipe out the guilt for the men who had died under his watch. The gunshot rang out, as Yarrick killed a good man, but a bad officer. One more burden on the list of those who had met his emperor's judgement. It never got easier. Some were traitors, some were cowards, but some had just faltered once, and that was enough. He was a commissar, a symbol, and defender of the orthodoxy, but most importantly, he was human. Despite the weight of the burdens he carried, what was one more added to the pile? As he informed the man he respected, the man who could have had a future, Sergeant Hanozek, that no help was coming. Into the temple, the brave officer led his men as Yarrick heard their screams over the Vox. The sergeant had earned the respect of someone hearing his glorious death and journey to the Emperor's side. When people have been derived of ability to act, they will respond to leadership with gratitude and vigor. To have direction becomes a form of salvation in its own right. Harness this human characteristic, and there is very little that you cannot accomplish. A life of unending war, death, and service to the Emperor. Despite the rejuvenant treatments, that kept the man, Sebastian Yarrick, looking like a middle-aged man. Something ancient lay beneath. How many men had he seen die? 
The fact that he surpassed the age of his grandfather did not slip him. It had been decades since his reassignment to the Armageddon Steel Legion, after the events on Mistral. Armageddon had been the closest thing to a home he had ever known. The air was filthy and oil slick, browns and yellows painting a visage no one would dare call beautiful. Corrosive rain and towers of black smoke dotted this hellscape of a world. Virulent forests hung around the equator, bleeding out until reaching the ash wastes that grew from the various enormous hive cities, filled with humans stacked upon each other to the point of absurdity. Billions upon billions called this polluted waste home. Observe and learn. The lesson he had enacted over decades, as Yarrick had visited the various holdings and hive cities over the years. He observed its spires and depths, its gilded corridors and the noble quarters, and the grime and blood-drenched alleys in the sunless underworld. Towards the spire of Hive Infernus, the old Commissar walked, finding himself greeted by the Lord Commissar, Seroth. Disgust was written across the face of his once friend. The Emperor's mercy Yarrick had given their mentor, Rasp, had broken their friendship, and now Yarrick was about to face the consequences as the two walked to the luxurious quarters of the planet's ruler, Overlord Hermann von Strab. It was like looking into the past, that disgust that had risen up, as Yarrick had looked upon the Cardinal Vargaheim of Mistral. Hermann von Strab was as wide as he was tall, bald and bloated, and with a grin that stunk of superiority. In a voice that was deep and nasal, Hermann von Strab began to speak of Yarrick's missteps, of his return from purging the orcs at the head of the 252nd expedition. It was clear this whole display was a farce as Yarrick's concerns of some greater danger at play was instantly ignored. A name, Gazkul those orcs had chanted, with a fervor that had unnerved him. But no, this was no briefing. It was meant to be a humiliation, as Von Strab, with a sickly smile, announced Yarrick's retirement at the behest of the good Lord Commissar Seroth. Yarrick was furious, his fingers twitched, as he considered for a moment killing the vile scum. It took every ounce of his will to hold himself back. A life of overseeing the recruitment in Hades Hive was nothing short of exile. Yarrick knew it. He left, seething, but his humiliation was not what weighed upon his mind. It was the unnerving sense that some greater danger was coming to Armageddon and now he felt powerless to prepare for it. At the sides of a colossal parade, a figure approached Yarrick, a face he had not seen for a long time. Sister Sethino. Gone was the color of the now destroyed order, replaced by the gray of mourning and a duty unfulfilled. Those same cold dead eyes matching his virulent zealous ones the scars of those who had gazed into the Immaterium. Her presence only meant one thing, danger. To the skies they all saw it. Yarrick, Sethino, and the billions that lived upon Armageddon. An enormous space hulk tore its way from the Immaterium in a shriek. It was the size of a moon, a world of twisted metal that roared towards them. Orcs. The claw of desolation, they called it, as its shadow loomed overhead. A swath of the sky itself burned as the Space Hulk began to fall towards the surface. It was like hell itself was descending as the blaze reflected in those old eyes. The ones that had seen the devastation of orcs as a boy. He glared at it. He let those around him see it. He knew his role and the example he had to set for the apocalypse to come. The planet rumbled as the Xenos moon made planetfall, but what shocked Yarrick more was the absence of mobilization. Why? Did Von Strab think the Greenskins were dead upon impact? 
Was he mad? The Overlord was seemingly delusional and surrounded by none brave enough to stand up to him. The various Hive cities were on their own. Yarrick, Sethano, and half a regiment began to roll across the northern wastes in the eerie dead of night. This response was not enough, and clearly someone wanted him dead. Once again he clenched his jaw at the political machinations Von Strapp seemed to be playing. Again he thought of that moment when he could have killed him, but the task before him was the priority. The tanks and transports rolled out as the might of the Imperium's nearly endless resource, humanity, rode out to war. After hours upon the approach to Hive Tempestora, the battle began. As Yarrick and Sethano felt their transport rock, he was weightless for several seconds in the air, and then the sickening crunch as he fell to the steel floor. They had been hit. Stepping over the dead of his transport, Yarrick and Sethano emerged into the night. The orcs had come, and worst of all, they had caught them by surprise. Covered in minor wounds, Yarrick couldn't help but think this was beyond the normal tactical acumen of the orcs he knew so well. His men began to falter, but the symbol of equal hope and fear was amongst them, a commissar, and only in death does duty end. To their east, they saw it, the shambling monstrosity that was the Orc Horde, marching, a green tide of Xenos and scrap steel, for miles it stretched. The laughing monsters of Yarrick's childhood were here in numbers he had never seen. We cannot save Tempestora, Sethano said, words he would have killed any soldier for saying, but she was right. But there, they could buy time for the other hives. Yarrick and the other survivors began to run as they heard with dread the rising sounds of rumbling behind them. Bikers. There was no defense in the open, so they ran even harder, Yarrick's lungs roaring with hot air and exhaustion. The orc bikes finally raced into view as rounds the size of fists whizzed past Yarrick's head. Circling around, the orcs were now ahead of them, as a wave of metal met one of meat and bone. Bolter and Laz barked as the bike slammed into the ranks of the Steel Legion. Men and women were ripped apart and tossed into the air like ragdolls. The sight was horrific. Yarrick felt the wet crunch of dying comrades at his feet, as still the column had to push on. Coming head on, Yarrick plunged his blade into an orc's neck tumbling the rider and bike. Prometheum and rockets were unleashed from the Imperial's line, breaking apart the bloodthirsty Xenos. The overwhelming firepower stored the orcs, long enough for Yarrick to burst forth with a counter charge. For Tempestora, for Armageddon, our path is over the bones of the Greenskins. Yarrick, Sethano, and the guard killed with hate only to be met with sadistic laughs and rallies for their profit. Gazkul, Gazkul they cried. An ensuing melee began, a mosh pit of bone, blood and corpses. Thousands were dead, and many had been left behind, but finally the column made it to the walls of Hive Tempestora. The news that the city, home to billions of ordinary, innocent people, was walking dead was a pill none could swallow. He hated it. To admit the failure even before it would happen. He had seen many failures over the multiple lifetimes he had lived. Each a stain he would answer at the Emperor's side. But realism was needed now, not the infectious delusion of Von Strab. They had but hours until the main Orc menace arrived, and so the building of defenses began. Turrets, barricades, and the Prometheum deposits that had put the hive on the map was flooded throughout the city's water system. The millions of those who couldn't fight were granted leave, much to the disgust of Sethano, their lack of zealotry, weakness in her cold eyes. The people ran, though Yarrick knew they wouldn't get far in the ash wastes. The desperate civilians fled in panic, even trampling their own 
as they burst through the rear gates. From the mile-high spires to the sunless underhives, many would never make it out, and Yarrick knew they'd be nothing more than a distraction for the orcs. Time had run out, nightfall had come, and the enemy were at the gates. The orc menace would break in, it wouldn't be long, but Yarrick had hate, faith in the Emperor and a Promethean death waiting for them. Hive Tempestora, home to billions, men and women who had laughed, cried, and simply lived, until it was utterly annihilated. He heard the sound first as they ran, then came the heat and the light, and a roar of flame washed over the entire city. The howl of the orcs was as loud as the screams of those still trapped within. The blast knocked Yarrick off balance, and as he rose, the running continued. The heat in his lungs, from the flame and exhaustion almost too much. It was moments like these where he truly felt his age. From beyond the walls, Yarrick, Sethino, and their men retreated. The inferno of a dead city reflecting in their eyes. The smoke was almost atmospheric clogging, but the smell was something that would never leave him. He stood by his decision, bearing the terrible weight in the name of victory and the greater survival of Armageddon. Assembling their men to move on to High Volcanus, Yarrick was met with something worse than enemy fire. A handful of orcs, laughing. They gunned down the messengers as Yarrick digested what this meant. This Gazkol was amused. How? How did an orc anticipate this move? The flame engulfing trap, turning an entire city into a furnace. The name Gazkul was becoming something more in his mind, an adversary that was nothing like those he had faced before. But there would be no rest as Yarrick, Sethano, and the regiment rode to High Volcanus. Yarrick couldn't help but feel he was playing into Gazkul's hands. Hive Tempestora had burned, but the damage done was not nearly enough, as it seems only the orc fodder had been burned in the death of the entire city. Approaching the fortified walls of High Volcanus, Yarrick and his remnants joined the defenses, but still no action had been taken by Von Strab. His actions were borderline insanity. In the rumbling tide of smoke and dragged up dirt, the orcs arrived, hours later. As Yarrick and Sethano rallied outside the walls in a counter charge, in two great pincers they hammered and anviled the orcs, Yarrick's bolt gun barking and his saber wet as he cut down the vile Xenos filth. They were winning, but again something seemed wrong. The numbers they didn't add up. This orc force did not match those he had seen at Hive Tempestora. He had observed, and now he'd learnt just how again he had been outmaneuvered. A second orc force began to approach. A sea of metal and greenskins armored in bulky gear, with machines and the silhouettes of monsters in their ranks. It was the Imperials that had been caught in a pincer. The booming laughter rang out, chants to the prophet Gazkul. Gazkul, they cried. Yarrick cursed himself, he had studied orcs much in his life, their ways and even their language. But this prophet had broken those patterns. Yarrick was learning. Every move Gazkul made formed a picture even as the Imperials began their desperate retreat. The Orc artillery slammed next to them as thousands upon thousands of men darted back to the safety of High Volcanus. The scale was almost mind-numbing, as the hordes of humans and Orcs clashed. Be the symbol, the thought rang in his mind as Yarrick bellowed those to rally to him. I am not done with the Greenskins. I will fight them and I will find the means to do so. Barely scraping through the city's gates, 
Once again, Yarrick felt the hot rage flood his veins. The orc tide coming was even greater than the one at long dead Tempestora. Vulcanus would fall. He knew it. Again he had failed to stop the enemy. Again a city would fall. He vowed it. Vulcanus would fall, but this time he would make the orcs bleed, truly, for every stone they claimed. It was almost too much to bear witness to. The heat, the explosions and screams, a battle the scale of which stretched for miles across the walls of High Vulcanus. The citizens had been given arms, turning the field into an apocalyptic wall of fire and bolt rounds as two million strong armies earned the namesake of the world, Armageddon. Yarrick and Sethano had turned Vulcanus into a death trap, at the cost of an ocean of human and Xenos blood. Skyscrapers and spires crashed around them, and ordnance fire beat into an unending drum of war. If only they had more troops, Yarrick thought, cursing Hermann von Strab again as men and women fell around him. Vulcanus burned, steel legion, innocent civilians and orcs falling in the thousands by the minute. In brutal street to street, dark alleyway to grand spire combat. Time. They needed more time and more men, more aid or Armageddon would fall, one hive at a time. In secret communiques with Princeps Manaheim, Yarrick, and Sethano once again came to the conclusion to let another hive fall as they reinforced another city. But by the God Emperor Yarrick would save this world. Not again would he be found wanting or outmaneuvered by that accursed Gazkul. Leaving Sethano to buy time, Yarrick left towards Hive and Furnace. If the delusional Von Strab and his kowtowed lackey Lord Commissar Seraph wouldn't call for aid, then he would. The war had moved beyond them. They needed something greater in their arsenal. The Emperor's finest, his angels, the Adeptus Astartes. He had to move quickly. Yarrick beamed straight for the Astropath Choir. Von Strab would never agree to the interference of outside forces, even if Armageddon was decimated. Yarrick burst through the door to the choir room, straight to Master Genest. The decrepit blind man told him that the warp storms around them made the call for aid almost impossible, if not directly against Von Strab's wishes. Torn between his vow, his faith, and cold reason, Yarrick, with a deep anger in his voice, told him that Armageddon could fall, but he would not let it. We will win by doing what must be done. He had condemned two cities to death, and no more would fall. Not under his watch. He told Genes that he does not ask. The God Emperor demands it and we have always owed him everything. The call would cost a lot, many astropaths would die, and Von Strab would try to stop them. But what choice did they have when facing failure for the God Emperor? Standing at the door, with the astropath guards on his side, Yarrick prepared for the enemy that was coming, their own. The elevator doors opened to a wall of Laz and Bolter as Von Strauss personal guard met the fury of a commissar. Men fell and splinters flied as the choir sang into the war. Your actions betray Armageddon and the Emperor Yarrick spat as he cut down the mob of men thrown at him. His allies fell and his pistol clicked empty as Von Strab finally emerged. As he surrendered, Yarrick enjoyed the mask slip on Von Strab's face as he was too late. A scream, a single voice, and many. A mosaic of psychic pain burst out from the choir room, wrapping Yarrick's soul as he covered his ears. Blood ran from Genest's eyes as he whispered with muted strength. 
It is done. Commissar Sebastian Yarrick, veteran of a hundred wars, witness to the deaths of thousands, of millions, a political officer, disciple of Rasp, and guardian of the orthodoxy, may have just saved Armageddon. And now he would suffer for it, as he was escorted in shame to Lord Commissar Serov's quarters. The tension was palpable between them, Sebastian and Dominic, men who had been like brothers, who had been raised in the Scholar Progenium together, a brotherhood broken with the death of Rasp. Yarek had observed and learnt enough about his former friend to see the unease behind his venomous words. He knew Von Strab's conduct was madness, yet his blind hatred for Yarek had clouded his judgement. Yarek had executed men for less, but he had no power here, only the disdain for the corrupt. Again Yarek was banished, his destination would be a future gravesite, the next target on the path of Gazkul's green tide, Hades Hive. Escorted from the spires to the protest of those with sound mind, Yarek was taken to his new posting. His right arm, that old wound from Mistral, began flaring up, as if a phantom pain was warning of what was to come. Hades Hive, one of the smaller backwater hives dominated by industry and smog, so potent the sky was grim and black, graced tunnels and chambers weaved beneath the hollowed mountain it rested upon. No reinforcements were coming, as the people stunk of desperation, but Yarrick could use that. When people have been deprived of the ability to act, they will respond to leadership with gratitude and vigour, harness this human characteristic, and there is very little you cannot accomplish. Hades would become his fortress, here would be where he would hold to his vow to the Emperor, he would turn it into a hell for the orcs. Here Gazgul's tide would break. A smile crept across Yarek's old face. It was beautiful. The battlefield where he had observed and learnt what he could unleash. Being a symbol is nothing. Being a legend. I accept the burden laid upon my shoulders by the will of the Emperor, and it is an honor that I am deemed worthy to carry it. But I will shed no tears when he declares my duty done and calls me to the Golden Throne. I stepped up to the Vox and looked out at Hades. I had spoken to all of Vulcanus, then I had been a veteran commissar. Now I was engaging in a willful transformation, whatever is necessary. A victory, I said. I sharpened my gaze. It was directed at every soul who could see me. Yes, I am looking at you. I am judging you. You witnessed a victory today, didn't you? No. You witnessed a reprieve. Are you looking at me and at the heroes of the Steel Legion and thinking that we have the Orcs well in hand? Are you? Then you are beneath contempt. You are abandoning your fellows and Hades and Armageddon. You are abandoning the Emperor. This was a reprieve and a chance. You see what can be done. Know this now. You will stand with us. You will fight. In all the days of blood ahead, you will fight, or I will execute you myself. Do this, and victory will come. What is victory? I paused. What is victory? Again, I waited. Victory is when all the green skins lie dead on the soil they profaned. The cheers came. It began with the troopers, who understood the battles. But it spread to the civilians, to the streets, to the interior of the archaeologies, to the manufactura, 
to the chapels and cathedrals. The hive city called for blood. In Volcanus, the people had been ready to fight. That was not enough. The orcs had become an extension of their prophet's will. I made no heretical claims for myself. We were all bound to be extensions of the Emperor's will. But I would see his will enforced by any means necessary. Hades shall not fall! I shouted, and the cheer became a roar. The chanting grew louder as I neared the wall. I ran through a battle of fanaticism. On the side of the wall, our forces were calling my name. As I climbed the steps to the battlements, I heard the countering cries of Ugohard from the orcs beyond. And at the top, just to the south of the gate, I heard a guttural, booming, inhuman voice snarl. Yarek! I stepped into a tableau of suspended war. The ramparts had been battered, smoke rolled over the wall, several cannon turrets had been demolished. On the far side, the ground was a patchwork of overlapping craters, filled with the wreckage of orc guns. Thousands of orc foot soldiers crowded forward to climb the siege ladders. The defenders had destroyed the ladders as they appeared, and the orcs fired upwards, clearing the way for more ladders to rise. A stalemate. A few orcs had reached the top of the wall. I found myself in their midst. Before me, barely more than five meters away, and striding back and forth on the section of the battlements he had claimed for himself, was the giant who roared my name. He was summoning his rival to combat, and he had already dismissed Helm as being unworthy of that claim. The colonel was slumped against the wreckage of a cannon, just on the other side of the war boss. He was moving, but weakly. His right arm was hanging at a strange angle. Blood soaked his face. Orcs lined both ends of the war boss's territory, echoing each of his shouts. I knew what this beast was, and I spat back his name at him. Ugolhard. The war boss turned. His pistol was larger than a heavy bolter. His right arm was encased in a power claw. I recalled seeing this orc leading the first charge on Tempestora. Did silence fall over the battlefield at that moment? I don't trust my memory on this point. All of my focus was on this foe. But I have a sense of orcs and humans pausing as two symbols clashed. I knew what was at stake. I'm sure Ulguhar did too. He looked down at me, and I saw disappointment glittering in those red eyes. Ridiculously small in that giant skull. Ulguhard had come to fight the leader who had destroyed his gargans and found a human no larger than any of the others and much older. I drew bolt pistol and sword. Ulguhard grinned. He raised his claw and stepped forward to crush me with a single blow. I charged him, coming in under the blow. The claw punched and missed. I fired bolt shells into his chest plate and stabbed to the right, jabbing my blade into the meat of his gun arm. Ulguhard snarled and staggered back a step. He turned the gun on me. I fired straight into its barrel. The massive pistol blew up. Ulguhard hurled the twisted mass at me and it smashed my shoulder hard enough to spin me around. I moved back, putting some distance between us. He watched me and his grin was pleased. I was giving him a fight. The orc's ruined pistol had struck my left shoulder, but it was my right that ached. The throbbing was back, worse than ever. It threatened to dull my reactions, and when Ugohard advanced again, each step was a dark familiarity, as if our every move had been choreographed, and I had seen it all before. Reaching out from a century and a half, the winds of Mistral blew against my neck. I felt the grip of the demon, Gal Shahana, tighten around my soul. I had lived these moments before. In fragments and premonitions, they had stabbed into my dreams. Now the mosaic was coming together. Ugohard swung his claw again. He was slow. I jumped back and stepped into his left. His swing pulverized a cremunation. His momentum kept him turning, and now his back was towards me. 
It was too heavily armored. I raised my blade to cut through his left arm again. There was a blur, and Ugohard whirled around, laughing. His sluggishness had been a ruse. He seized my sword arm with the power claw. Dream and physical agony merged. I convulsed and dropped my sword. Ugohard straightened to his full height. He stretched out his arm to show my dangling body first to one army and then the other. He roared his triumph. Then he clamped down. My bones cracked. Blood burst from between the halves of the claw. My lips drew back in pain and hatred. My teeth ground together. I hissed in rage and did not cry out. Laughing, Ugohard held my left shoulder with his other hand. He cocked his head, waiting to see that I understood what he was about to do. He pulled, he crushed, and I came apart. The pain flared white and ultraviolet at its center as muscle shredded and bone splintered. There was an uncanny liberation, the moment in whose shadow I had lived since Mistral had come, and it could wear me at no longer. The light of the pain turned to darkness. Unconsciousness came for me. But I rejected it. I had nothing now but my will, and with it, I would kill this monster. Ugohar dropped me and I fell into a crouch. Blood jetted from my right shoulder, soaking my flank. The warboss examined my mutilated limb in his claw. I was beneath his notice. My sword was within reach. I seized it with my left hand. I grasped the steel. I took my pain and all of the agony of burning Armageddon, and I forged them into a single action. I rose. Ugrod! I shouted. He looked down, surprised. I thrust the blade through the seam of his armor and all the way through his throat. His eyes glazed with shock. His knees buckled. I sawed the blade back and forth. His wet, choking gave way to the powerful spray of Vitae. It fountained over me. Still I sawed, cutting through gristle and bone, and my pain and weakness. I cut all the way through. I could no longer feel my body. My fingers were growing clumsy, but I held off the black. I dropped the sword and seized the huge skull. I carried it to the edge of the parapet. Now I held my trophy high, brandishing it before the orcs. I am Yarrick. I look upon you and you die. Do you see, Gas Kalfraka? Hades will never be yours. Armageddon will never be yours. This is where we stop you. Here is where you fail. I hurled Ugohard's head from the wall. The orcs cried out, and they fled. And then, at last, I let the dark come. He was surrounded by weapons fire, flame, and heat brushing his face as he stood on top of a boulder before him. The enemy retreats. Behold the work of faith and steel. Comrades, we have humbled mountains, roared Yarrick with his saber held high. The orcs cowed before him and ran as a rhythm was screened from the throats of thousands behind him. Yarrick, 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 they screamed as they looked towards a symbol. No, a legend. The defense of Hades' hive had begun. No more would Yarrick surrender ground to the prophet Gazkul. He had observed and learnt. He now knew to never underestimate the cunning of this enemy. They were battling an equal, something as intelligent as any human Yarrick had faced before. On the hollowed mountainside city, Yarrick left the light as he descended into the dark underhive. Almost like he was a boy again, following his grandfather into New Cadian decades ago. Yarrick, without any guard or viable defense, strode proudly, defiantly into the filthy, stench-ridden backwater streets, letting his black sleek uniform bring to him those he was seeking. 
in the gloomy glow strips depths, finally they emerged, the underhive gangs, draped in crude fashion, and armed with cleavers and axes as broken and rusty as the underhive itself. He wasn't intimidated. His eyes had seen decades of brutal war, and it would take more than a mere human to move him. Gathering the gangs together, the bloody, teeth filed, modified filthy beings that pass for human, the Commissar asked them if they can fight. Because it was time to shed blood, the Emperor commands it. In truth, the Emperor's authority barely reached here, but death was coming to them all, so what choice did they have? It was the role of the political officer to read people, just as Rasp had taught him. The gangs knew Hades better than anyone, and with a civilian force that matched his Steel Legion regiments, his numbers had multiplied. With the gangs came knowledge that would turn Hades from a siege into an ambush. Descending down abandoned mine shafts that stretched like veins under the land before the city, Yarrick, the Steel Legion and the gangs ascended into the tunnels as the orc forces above marched, the chance of a new name echoing in the tunnel's halls. Orglehard, Orglehard, Orglehard. They chanted in their foul Xenos tongue. A warlord of Gazkul, clearly strong enough to lead his own contingent. Yarrick wanted Gazkul. He craved his death, but this Orglehard would do. Laying charges and standing ready at trap latches, the Imperials were ready to strike until Yarrick heard it. Missiles. Human missiles. Hermann von Strab. It all made sense now. His apathy and madness. His plan had been to emulate the Orcs in one move. Virus bombs. Yarrick slammed the hatch shut and bellowed to his men to run. Back down the tunnels they darted as he ordered those in the city to find shelter immediately. They had but minutes, and then the fire came. A wash of heat and flame carpeted over the Orc Horde and Hades Hive. By the Emperor's luck, many of the ancient bombs had failed to detonate, but the devastation was brutal. A thrum sounded through the tunnels as the planet-killing fire above raged then faded into an eerie silence. The orcs had been decimated, but many of the defenders of Hades' hive had been caught up in the radius. The sight and smell of those eaten alive on the molecular level would haunt the living. Von Strapp had clearly planned to mop up all of his inconveniences in one fell swoop. His arrogance, his madness had crossed the line. He was a traitor. But the enemy above would have to die first. The orcs' ranks had been thinned, but not destroyed. So once again, Yarrick and the surviving regiments and gangs took up their positions. A grin crept across Yarrick and his men's faces. He was not above a bloodthirsty anticipation, and he felt no shame for it. For revenge was coming. Now Yarrick roared as melted charges set off in distant tunnels. The Gargan stompers and hordes of greenskins fell into a pit of rubble and death as Yarrick and the Imperials leapt from their hatches. Bolter and Laz flew as their feet trudged along the green sludge and blood left from the previous virus bombs. It was a slaughter, a turning of the tide as the orcs now became the victims of the Emperor's wrath. Fire, death and hate poured from Yarrick and the forces of Hades. Each green skin that fell felt like justice for the dead of Armageddon. Thousands upon thousands of orcs died in the cacophony of violence until they began to retreat. They all saw it, from the Xenos to the humans, the Commissar upon the boulder. Like a living myth, a man of piety and hate became a legend, a silhouette. A beacon for humanity as the Imperial screamed his name. Yarrick. Yarrick they cried as the orcs looked on in fear at the creature that had brought their downfall. Being a symbol is nothing. 
being a legend. I accept the burden laid upon my shoulders by the will of the Emperor, and it is an honor that I am deemed worthy to carry it. Humanity lives for the lies, justice, mercy, honor, and most importantly, hope. Hope is the ember that never dies, only waiting for someone to give it oxygen. The first push back had been victorious, but to the Xenos that loved war, the challenge and possibility of a good fight had lit something beneath them. Yarrick and his men returns to the city, to the cries of celebration. The look in the people's eyes was one of hope as they saw the Commissar before them. A new vigor had been restored to the people of Hades as they prepared for the next assault. The reprieve was short, as the orcs of Ulguhard once again attacked. In the underground mines and sewers, men and women fought the orcs in the cramped and dark underways, a place where the hive gangs and men and women of Armageddon thrived. Blood and bodies clogged the narrow paths as Yarrick set off ambush after ambush. They led the orcs in far enough until they unleashed a reservoir of water, drowning some of his own men, but thousands of orcs. Again, the people looked to the commissar, Yarrick the symbol. They cheered in chorus with the drowning orcs until word came from the surface. Yarrick rallied and in breaking towards the surface to the clog-filled atmosphere of Armageddon, he began to hear the orcs chant, Ulguhard, Ulguhard, echoed from the ramparts as he approached. And then he truly heard it, a guttural, booming, inhuman voice snarl, Yarrick. The warboss turned to see the small, old human approach. His pistol was larger than a heavy bolter. His right arm was encased in a power claw. The boy from Teos III drew his saber as he prepared to face the nightmare his grandfather had warned about. Ulguhard was enormous, towering over him with knotted green muscle and a bestial grin, contorted with disappointment and yet also excitement. The duel began. Man versus beast, as Yarrick lashed out with saber and bolter. The impact made his bones vibrate, as his body screamed for being pushed so far. His right arm began to ache. The prescient visions from Mistral, the ones he had tried to ignore, began to play out, as Ugulhard feigned sluggishness and then clamped his power claw onto Yarrick's right arm. The pain flared white and ultraviolet as muscle shredded and bone splintered, and with a wet crunch, Yarrick felt his arm sever, as Ugohard roared in pantomime's triumph. Unconsciousness came for him as Yarrick sank to his knees, but he rejected it. Adrenaline is your ally, boy. Yarrick rose from his knees, grasping the fallen saber with his left hand, he thrust it into the surprised face of Ulgulhard. He sawed the blade back and forth until its prize came clean off. His body was numb, shutting down, but still the word rang in his mind. Be the symbol. Sebastian Yarrick rose and screamed, I am Yarrick. I look upon you and you die. Do you see Gazkul Thraka? Hades will never be yours. Armageddon will never be yours. Here is where we stop you. Here is where you fail. The orcs cowered and ran as they stared at death itself. Holding to the last of his strength, the hero of Armageddon finally let the dark come. Months now. Months of fighting above ground and below. Hades burned. It bled. It screamed, but it stood. It would continue to stand. I had vowed it would, and my vow is iron. I moved through the disused ventilation shaft with Lana's squad and the Rachen. There was a nest of orcs close by. 
Their snarls reached us through the walls of the shaft. The maze of the mines and the underhive was a weapon for both sides of the conflict. We moved beneath their camps. They infiltrated the hive. We had come to punish their temerity once more. I stopped walking and listened. The orcs were just on the other side of the curved wall of the shaft. Remember, I whispered, leave one alive. Why, Atroxa grumbled, so it can spread the tale. I spread my right arm, my powerful arm, Ugelhart's claw. With a single blow, I punched through the metal and burst through the pipe. The orcs reared back in alarm. The monster had come upon them. Be the symbol, the needful role of the Commissar. I had learned that lesson early. But in Hades, I had to be more. Be a legend. And now I knew that my name must have meaning for the enemy as well. The orcs had their profit. I would be something else. I crushed a green-skinned skull with my claw. I glared at the stunned brutes, and as my eye blazed with killing ruby light, I became their nightmare. Thracker strode into the chamber. He stopped at the edge of the pit. Our heads were almost level, and we exchanged a long stare. Thraka's face was the purest essence of his benighted race. It was the monstrousness of war at its most savage, pure beast, made more hideous by a cross-hatching of scars. It was a leathered pamiplest of wounds, some I had given him and they were insignificant. The only wound that mattered was the one that almost stopped him, but instead, following the dictates of perverse destiny, had been his making. The top of his skull was adamantium. I couldn't imagine what had happened to the brain beneath to transform him into a prophet of orcish victory. But the claw that had operated on this orc's mind was stained with the blood of billions. Thraka watched me closely. He watched me quietly. He was studying me. I was suddenly drenched in a sweat that had nothing to do with physical discomfort. The only thing worse than being face to face with a raging, howling orc is being face to face with a quiet one. So many human victories have depended on the orc's tactical simplicity. They charged until they died, and that was all. But an orc who watched and learned, planned and strategized, an orc who meditated and kept his thoughts to himself, there could be nothing more dangerous. Then the silence was broken, and to my eternal dishonor, it was I who broke it. Filth! The Emperor's wrath will blast you and all your accursed kind to the warp! My hatred burst the bonds of language and in the next second, I was baying an inarticulate. <laughs> At the beast, he continued to watch quietly. The irony of that moment did not escape me. After a few more shouts of incoherent, impotent rage, I calmed enough to speak again. I will kill you. I make you that promise. No reaction. Still that unnerving studying. I didn't know what he was looking for, or whether he saw what he wanted in my face, but he stepped back after an eternal moment. The guard who had fetched him took the gesture's permission to have me. It laughed and gave my left arm a hard yank, almost pulling it from my shoulder. There was a blur of movement from Thraka as he stood with the guard struggling in the grip of his claw. The orc whimpered, its feet pedaled air. Thraka held the other orc over the pit, his eyes, one real, one the targeting bionic never left my face. His mouth spread in a grin of predatory challenge. Then he dropped the guard. The orc howled as it fell. The acoustics of the shaft turned his cry into a choir of hurt. The sound of impact was wet and a long time coming. 
The howl stopped. Thraka reached above me and took the chains in his claw. He was no longer smiling. The gaze of that eye was penetrating, evaluating. There was also a complicity, which I rejected with all the hatred of my own look. He gave a slight nod. To me. I was imagining that. Surely. I prayed to the God Emperor that I was mistaken. Then I heard the deep, final chunk of the claw slamming shut and the chains parting. The terrible pull on my upper arms ended, and with freedom came vertigo. I fell into darkness, into my final seconds, and into a strange peace. There was nothing I could do, nothing to struggle against. For the first time in living memory, I was absolved of all responsibility. Duty ends only in death, and I had been vouchsafed a few moments to experience the release from duty. I commended my soul to the care of the Emperor, and I went limp. I plunged into terrible sounds. A thick wind screamed against me. I saw nothing but the dark, and after the first second, it seemed that I was flying, not falling. I felt the pain of unfinished tasks. I hoped for forgiveness. I thought that there were worse deaths. I had the luxury of several long seconds to think of these things, and even now, there are moments of marrow deep exhaustion when I look back on this tiny sliver of rest with something like nostalgia before shame corrects my thinking. I woke, and I was complete. I knew, before I opened my eye, that what had been taken from me was mine again. My right arm felt heavy. Lethal, I looked. My claw was there, as it should be. There was no power flowing to it, nor was there to my bale eye. Still, their presence was reassurance enough. But how had I been rescued? I sat up, taking in my surroundings. I was lying on an operating table, filthy with blood and reeking with the stench of a thousand atrocities. I was in the Medicaid Bay, but the tools that I saw would have horrified the most fanatical Chirrigan. I had not been rescued. I was still on the Space Hulk. My claw and eye had been reattached. Correctly. The two realities were incompatible, at so fundamental level that their coexistence made my skin crawl. I swung my legs over the edge of the table and stood. My injuries had blended into a general wash of pain. Nothing was broken though. I was intact. I could walk. I approached the door. It opened. I stopped. Beyond it, orcs lined both sides of the corridor. They had been watching for me. The moment I appeared, they roared their approval. They did not attack. They simply stood clashed guns against blades, and hooted brute enthusiasm. I had been subjected to too many celebratory parades in Armageddon, not to recognize one when it confronted me. I went numb from the unreality before me. I stepped forward, though I had no choice. I walked. It was the most obscene victory march of my life. I moved through the corridor, Holden Bay, and the mass ranks of the greenskins hailed my passage. I saw the evidence of the destruction I had caused around every bend. Scorch marks, patch ruptures, buckled flooring, collapsed ceilings, but it hadn't been enough. Not nearly enough. Only enough for this. This. I was living in an event that had no name. At length, I arrived at the launch bay. There was a ship on the pad, before the door. It was human, a small in-system shuttle, but not built for long voyages. No matter, as long as its Vox system was still operative, I knew that it would be. Gazkul, Mag Uruk Thraka, awaited me beside the ship's access ramp. I did not let my confusion, or the sense that I had slipped into an endless waking nightmare slow my stride. I did not hesitate as I strode towards the monster. I stopped before him. 
I met his gaze with all the cold hatred of my soul. He radiated delight. Then he leaned forward. A colossus of armor and bestial strength. Our faces were mere centimeters apart. My soul bears many scars from the days and months of my defeat and captivity. But there is one memory that, above all others, haunts me. By day, it is a go to action. By night, it murders sleep. It lives with me always. The proof that there could hardly be any more terrible threat to the Imperium than this orc. Thraka spoke to me, not in orcish, not even in low gothic, in high gothic. A great voice, he said. He extended a huge, clawed finger and tapped me once on the chest. My best enemy! He stepped aside and gestured to the ramp. Go to Armageddon! Make ready for the greatest fight! I entered the ship. My being marked my words whose full measure of horror lay not in their content, but in the fact of their existence. I stumbled to the cockpit and discovered that I had a pilot. It was Rog. His mouth was parted in a scream, but there was no sound. He had no vocal cords any longer. There was very little of his body recognizable. He had been opened up, reorganized, fused with the ship's controls and guidance systems. He had been transformed into a fully aware servitor. I promised myself he would be one forever. Take us out of here, I ordered. The rumble of the ship's engines powering up was drowned by the even greater roar of the orcs. I knew that roar for what it was. The promise of war beyond description. In silence, I made the orcs a promise of my own. They were letting me go because I had lived up to my legend. I would do more than that when they came again to Armageddon. Legend would clash with legend, and I would bring them more than war. I would bring them more than apocalypse. I would bring them extinction. He chased him into the stars, with the ruins of Armageddon in their wake. For months, the man, the symbol, the legend, Commissar Sebastian Yarrick, led the defense of Hades' hive. Now donning the power claw of the dead warboss, Ulglehard, and a bionic eye that inspired dread amongst the orcs. Old Baalai, they called him. The man who could kill with a look. The name was spoken with reverence by both humans and orcs. A name that reached the ears of Gazkul Mag Uruk Thraka, as force after force was thrown at the kill zone that was Hades' hive. The time Yarrick had bought was precious, as finally emerging from the stars came the Angels of Death, the Adeptus Astartes. The Blood Angels, Ultramarines, and Salamander chapters had answered the call and began the reconquest of Armageddon. The Orc dead could be piled in mountains, as the full might of the Emperor's fury brought justice to the slain of Armageddon. After two years, since Jericus stared up hatefully into the sky as the Space Hulk ignited the atmosphere, Armageddon was at peace. His old body and mind had been pushed to the point of exhaustion and then beyond it. To take on the burden of being a symbol meant he couldn't crumble. He couldn't be seen as weak or tired. Legends don't tire. Legends aren't mortal men. But with victory secure and the rebuilding of Armageddon underway, the old man was allowed his rest. For months, Yarek let his wounds heal, and finally he had the closest thing to peace he had ever known. The retirement thrust upon him by the now missing Hermann von Strab and the exiled disgraced Seroth became his chosen reality. An officer of recruitment was his. But he looked at the knife, S with the name Yarek upon it, 
and thought of what his grandfather had told him the last time they had ever seen each other. The guard is never done with you, boy. Hate flared within Yarrick. He had lived a life of honorable service to the god emperor of mankind, but still he had no peace. Gazkul, that accursed Xenos filth. Fury burned in Yarrick as he remembered the dead of Hive Tempestora and Vulcanus. He remembered his vow to the Emperor to slay the threat, this enemy beyond anything he had faced before, this rival. A quiet end would not be his as long as Gazkul lived. The old Commissar came out of retirement and set off to the stars, a crusade that became a rally cry for those seeking to purge the Xenos filth, and in turn, those hoping for some glory that followed from the legendary Commissar, the hero of Armageddon. For years, Yarrick hunted him. He was consumed by the need to end this orc prophet, before he rose to even bigger infamy. Finally, the two forces converged on the planet of Golgotha, after Yarrick had followed the devastation left in Thraka's wake. Great columns of Imperial might, led by Yarrick in his personal Baneblade, the Fortress of Arrogance, rode across the sands of Golgotha. The horde of the Imperial War Machine was on the hunt, ready for the final confrontation. Under the cold light of the stars, Yarrick and his men found their paranoia rewarded. As finally the orcs attacked, Yarrick was ready, but much like the events on Mistral and Armageddon, the failure of others was his crutch. The rear column, led by Colonel Rog, a sixth son of a noble house, whose assignment had been a compromise, had cost Yarrick, as the young colonel froze up as the orcs attacked the rear. Reinforcements were not coming, as the orc hordes isolated and overwhelmed the forces Yarrick had built. Many of the veterans of Hades Hive, men and women who had seen the rise of the legend and followed him to the stars, were slaughtered. One more tally onto the score that had to be settled. Fire and death blotted Yarrick's vision as he saw his troops go down heroically. The Imperials matched the zeal of the Orcs until a silhouette emerged. It was enormous, towering and brutal. It moved with an unnatural speed and shifted the very moods in the air to one of dread. Yarrick fell sick to his soul as he roared Thraka into the fray. The battle had been lost, but Yarrick stood defiant as the two rivals finally stood face to face. But the righteous hate left Yarrick's eyes as the beast he had been chasing for years knocked him unconscious, the dark swallowing him up. He awoke in chains, the metal digging into his ankles and wrists as the old man, the hero of Armageddon, lay suspended over a great pit. His power claw, his bionic eye, and Commissar Uniform was gone, leaving the disabled man, Sebastian Yarrick, bare to the world. He looked up to see the face of Gazkul Mag Uruk Thraka staring back, and to his shame, Yarrick broke the silence as he screamed hate and vitriol into his rival's face, but no words or sound came back. The monstrous orc was just staring at him. The thought ran cold in his blood as Yarrick thought of exactly what the Orc Prophet was doing. Observe and learn. The chains were loosened and Yarrick began to tumble into the dark below. In those blissful moments, the sensation that death, a place by the Emperor's side was finally his, felt like peace. Peace for an ancient man who had seen so much war and had earned his rest. Into icy cold water the Commissar plunged, filth and stagnant water filling his lungs until he broke towards the surface. Phosphorescent fungi lit the damp rotten halls of what he now understood 
to be the inside of an enormous space hulk. Safety is an illusion, boy. Never forget that. Adrenaline is your ally, boy. Don't mistake it for fear. They're not the same thing. Weigh everything against your survival. Live to fight. Don't throw everything away on lost causes. The pit, the near lightless, stagnant hellscape became Yarrick's new home. A life he had lived before as a boy when the orcs had attacked his homeworld. And once again, Yarrick wasn't alone. Bulging chitinous creatures stalked the dark, hunting for the scraps of human and orc who fell down to their feeding ground. But Yarrick was not stuck down here with these monsters. They were trapped with him. Skulking in the shadows like a beast, the one-armed old man leapt out. Dozens of times he put his life on the edge as he murdered the creatures that walked into his territory. He feasted upon their foul meat. He drank the stagnant water, weighing everything against his survival. In the perpetual night, he lost track of how many days or weeks had passed. As if the concept was foreign, deep sleep became a memory as he took short bursts of rest with a blade in his hand. He had become the deadliest creature in a mosh pit of monsters. Not the largest or strongest, but the most cunning. From the piles of chitinous corpses, Yarek took their stingers, nailing them to the hull's walls and began climbing. His body was pushed to his limits and then beyond them, as hate and faith pushed the rising lactic acid down. After what felt like a lifetime, the old commissar peeked the surface lip, cutting down the orc guards and breaking his way into the next chamber, only to find more orcs who were seemingly expecting him. Yarrick raged as he was shoved down, beaten and dragged into another cage. Again he played out the part Gaskell had expected of him. Through the long, rusted corridors of the Hulk, the old man was dragged, thrust into a cage with other humans, slaves, and the prisoners of the defeat of Golgotha. To have spent so long in the dark, to have reverted to an animal-like state, only to be thrust into human interaction, jarred Yarrick. The survivors looked to see an old, one-armed man, disheveled and dotted with overgrown white hair, a juxtaposing view of the hero of Armageddon. But that cold fire was still in his eye. Yarrick had an oath to the Emperor to fulfill, and the role of political officer, to read people, told him that there were others who also desired vengeance and death. These chains wouldn't hold him forever, but if freedom was next to impossible, an escape, a dream, then Gazkul's death would do. They were letting me go because I had lived up to my legend. I would do more than that when they came again to Armageddon. Legend would clash with legend, and I would bring them more than war. I would bring them more than apocalypse. I would bring them extinction. Yarrick rose up in the filthy, blood-stained cage and turned to the man he saw stare back at him in disbelief. Colonel Rog, the sixth son, the man whose failure had led to the destruction of the rear column on Golgotha. Though Yarrick had suspected the shame the younger man carried, it didn't matter now. Immediately, Yarrick demanded the information he needed to know. There was no pattern to the guard shifts, and when the prisoners were taken out, they were worked until they dropped. Grueling manual labor in the scrap heaps that flooded this monstrosity of a space hulk. The thousands of slaves were worked until the numbers thinned down, most from exhaustion. Each shift dozens would never return, 
the piled up corpses in a disgraced corner, a weeding out of the weak. As if Yarek needed any more reminders of why he despised the orcs. Worst of all were the overseers, other humans, traitors, offered more food scraps for turning upon their own. Yarek began to speak, to roar out his defiance, but the orcs came running. The beating was brutal, but being the symbol meant more. Commissar Yarek was alive, and he wanted that news to spread. He knew how the people saw him, the hope and fear. When people have been deprived of the ability to act, they will respond to leadership with gratitude and vigor. Harness this human characteristic, and there is very little you cannot accomplish. Yarick's declaration bore fruit, and like rats in the dark, the brave scurried over to him. Rog, Benjamin Vale, Hans Beckett, Hadrian Trower, Ariana Castell, Ernest Polis, and to the surprise of Yarick, Berryman, their overseer. Survivors of the Battle of Golgotha and Orc Slaves, a crew of the broken and ill, many exhausted and beaten down in spirit over the endless weeks of grueling labor. Some of them were mad, their sanity almost snapped for what they had suffered, but all were united by hate and the desire for vengeance. The plan was constructed in secret, in the grime blood and rust filled slave pens, out of the hearing of their laughing, brutal Xenos overlords. Days, weeks, Yarick lost track in the sunless existence in the heart of the Space Hulk. Occasionally he caught glimpses of the beast he hated so much, Gazkul. But often enough the Orc Prophet was silent, only seeming to stare at the Commissar with curiosity. The manual labor was exhausting, especially on his old bones, but his faith in the Emperor, that endless well kept him alive, kept him going until the day finally came. Yarrick and the other humans trudged down the Promethean leaking corridor. Berryman used his whip upon the prisoners, with such venom that it barely caught the notice of the orcs, until he lashed it around one of their necks. They sprung into action. With only the zealotry a legend could inspire, brave men and women sacrificed themselves, igniting the Prometheum in a concussive boom of fire and smoke. Orcs and humans burned as Yarrick screamed, With me! Yarrick and his followers ran, darting off into the tight corridors, as the orcs and humans screamed in a mosh pit of panic. Gathering crude orc weapons, they became like rats, crawling through the greasy ancient shafts and the tunnels of this long dead melding of ships. The chants and roars of the Greenskins, a familiar sound to the survivor of Teos III. As Yarrick and his men clung to the shadows, Ernest Polis, a man who had clearly gone mad, utilized his eidetic memory to drive the group deeper into the Hulk, towards their target. Yet the sanity of this plan was not lost on Yarrick. They were all walking dead anyway. So why not use the remainder of their Emperor-given life to exact a toll upon the enemy? One by one, those brave and loyal followers fell, each taking the opportunity to earn the heroic death as a reward. Vale, Beckett, Castell, and Polis would be names etched into Yarrick's soul as he bore witness to the time they had brought him, and the mission. Orc blood stained the floors, as they reaped a toll, and vengeance for what they had suffered. But yet not all earned a glorious death in the Emperor's name, Colonel Rog. Over the many lifetimes Yarrick had lived, he had killed men who had failed, he had killed traitors, he had even killed a good man. But the most important life a political officer could take were the ones of cowards. Just as he did upon Golgotha, the young colonel, sixth son of a noble house, ran. A weak link in the rust of selfishness, 
what he would give, Yarrick thought, to hunt the colonel down. But he knew the coward would find no mercy in the arms of the Greenskins. Reflecting back at each other, grins that had a hint of madness to them, the disheveled Yarrick and Berryman were the last two standing. A one-armed, one-eyed old man and a broken soldier. The situation was almost comical. Reaching further into the orc sanctuaries, the two charged. With crude orc weapons and blades, they cut down the bulky beasts. Hate and piety, the fuel needed to bridge the gap in strength between them. Towards an elevator shaft, they pushed. But the commotion and time brought, an imperial blood had run out. The orc horde was coming. The roars and scream of the Xenos grew as Yarrick and Berryman launched themselves up the spiral staircase, the elevator moving up as the echoing stomps of the orcs grew closer behind them, reaching the top. As the klaxons ringed, the orcs stepped out from the elevator as the two threw grenades at them. The desperate scrambled realization registered on the beasts' faces as the platform exploded in a blaze of fire and metal. The blast caved in the top of the platform, and Yarrick and Berryman began to fall. The one-armed man clamped desperately with his blistering fingers as Berryman lashed onto his leg. For a second time, Yarrick stared down into an abyss, believing finally death was coming. Berryman tried to move up Yarrick, only for the old man's grip to slip. It wasn't going to hold. The two survivors stared at each other as Berryman told Yarrick, We've taught them a thing or two, eh, Commissar? Will you finish the mission? Yarrick swore to it as the smiling, brave man let go. Spreading like angels' wings, Berryman gave his life, another name to burn into his soul, Yarrick thought, as he gave every ounce of teeth-splitting strength to pull himself up. His body cried out for sleep, for rest, but what is will, but the strength of faith? What gives faith its strength, if not will? Become faith, become will, for the God Emperor of mankind. To the command room Yarrick strode, finding much to his disappointment, the absence of Gazkul. But the lives of those that had sacrificed themselves for him would be honoured, as Yarrick pressed every control, released every lever, and smashed every panel. The Space Hulk began to shake violently. The various ships in this mass graveyard all began to pull at each other. Flame and rubble began to erupt, and fall over the millions of orcs and thousands of human slaves trapped within. A death toll in the thousands upon thousands, as Yarrick made the force of this war bleed. The control room broke apart. Red light and klaxons flared, as finally the orcs broke in. The ground erupted beneath Yarrick, and once again he fell into a chaos of flame and tumbling metal. Again Yarrick let the dark come. Perhaps he had finally completed his debt to the Emperor. A life of unending war, rewarded with a place at the Emperor's side. But as he fell, he saw his rival, the beast he had chased for decades, laughing. Yarrick awoke, his bale eye and power claw reattached. Impossible, he thought. Standing up, Yarrick found the parody of a parade. Orcs lined up on either side chanting and raving, he faced it, the absurdity of this situation, and walked down the line. He would show them nothing, not an ounce of fear. Finally, he stopped before him, Gazkul Mag, Uruk Thraka, and met his gaze with all the cold hatred of his soul. The beast radiated delight. Then he leaned forward, and in high gothic, my best enemy, go to Armageddon, make ready for the greatest fight. Yarrick would live, because he gave them 
what they wanted. What Gazkul wanted. A proper fight. Approaching the fueled ship and his path towards escape, Yarrick made his vow. They were letting me go because I had lived up to my legend. I would do more than that when they came again to Armageddon. Legend would clash with legend, and I would bring them more than war. I would bring them more than apocalypse. I would bring them extinction. Hades Hive will not survive the first week. The man speaking is ancient, and he looks every hour of his age. What keeps him on his feet is a mixture of minimal rejuvenant, chem surgeries, crude bionics, and a faith in the Emperor founded in hatred for the enemies of man. I liked him the moment my visor targeting reticles locked onto him. Both piety and hate echo in his every word. He should not hold rank here, not to the degree he does. He is merely a commissar in the Imperial Guard, and such a title does not tend to make generals, colonels, Astartes captains, and chapter masters remain in polite silence when it comes to tactical planning. Yet to the humans of this war council and the citizens of Armageddon, he is the old man, a beloved hero of the Second War. 57 years ago, not just a hero, the hero. His name is Sebastian Yarrick. Even we Astartes must respect that name. And when he tells us that Hades Hive will be destroyed within a matter of days, a hundred Imperial commanders, human and Astartes alike, hang on his every word. I am one of them. Commissar Sebastian Yarrick leans over the edge of a hololithic display table with his remaining hand. The other arm is nothing but a stump. He keys in the coordinates on the numeric data pad, and the hololithic projection of Hades Hive widens. With flickering impatience to the display, both of the planet's hemispheres in insignificant detail. The old man, a gaunt and wizened human of sharp features, and skeletal obvious facial bones, gestures to the blip on the map that represents Hades Hive and its surrounding territories, wastelands. Six decades ago, the great enemy met his defeat at Hades. Our defense here was what won us that war. There are general murmurs of assent. The Commissar's voice carries around the expansive chamber, through floating skull drones equipped with Vox speakers, where their jaws had once been. I am surrounded by the familiar hum of active power armor, though the scents and faces that meet my eyes are new to me. Standing to my left, at a respectful distance, is Chapter Master Seth of the Flesh Terrors, known to his men as the Guardian of the Rage. He smells of sacred weapon oils, his Primarch's potent blood running beneath his weathered skin, and the icy, unwholesome reptilian scent of the lizard predator kings that stalk the jungles of his homeworld. Seth is flanked by his own officers, all bareheaded and with faces as pitted and cracked as their masters. Whatever wars have occupied the flesh terrors in recent decades, the conflicts have not been kind to them. To my left, my liege Helbrecht stands, resplendent in his battle armor of black and bronze. Bayard, the Emperor's champion, is by his side. Both rest their helmets on the table's surface, the stern's helm distorting the edge of the hololithic display as they give their full attention to the ancient Commissar. I cross my arms over my chest and do the same. Why? Someone asks. Their voice is low, too low to be human, and carries over the chamber without the need of Vox amplification. A hundred heads turn to regard an Astartes in bright red orange of a lesser chapter, one unknown to me. He steps forward, leaning his knuckles on the table, facing Yarrick from an almost twenty meter distance. We recognize Brother Captain Amaris. An Imperial Herald announces from his position at Yarrick's side, soothing the formal blue robes of his office. He bangs the butt of his staff on the ground three times. 
commander of the Angels of Fire. Amaris nods in thanks and fixes Yarrick with his unblinking gaze. Why would the Greenskin Warlord simply annihilate the greatest battlefield of the last war? Surely our forces should muster at Hades and stand ready to defend against the largest assault. Murmurs of agreement ripple throughout the gathering commanders. Emboldened, Amaris smiles at Yarrick. We are the Emperor's chosen mortal. We are his angels of death. We have centuries of battle experience compared to these human commanders at your side. Another voice replies. This one is distorted into a vox born snarl, filtered through a helm speakers. I swallow as the herald bangs the staff another three times. I had not realized I had spoken out loud. We recognize Brother Chaplain Grimaldus, reclusiarch of the Black Templars. Grimaldus shook his head at the gathered commanders. Over a hundred, human and Astartes, all gathering around the table in this converted auditorium once used for whatever dreary theatre performance occurred on a manufactory world. A riot of colours, heraldry, symbols of unity, varied uniforms, regimental designations, and iconography. General Kurov stood at the Commissar's shoulder, deferring to the old man in all things. The Xenos do not think as we do. The Greenskins do not come to Armageddon for vengeance, or to seek to bleed us for the defeats they have suffered at Imperial hands in the past. They come for the pleasure of violence. Yarrick, a skeleton wreathed in pale flesh and a dark uniform, watched the night in silence. Amaris pounded his fist onto the table and pointed at the Templar. For a moment of deathly calm, Grimaldus considered drawing his pistol and slaying him where he stood. That lends credence to my belief. Not at all. Have you inspected what remains of Hades' hive? It is a ruin. There is nothing left to fight over, nothing to defend. The great enemy knows this. He will be aware that Imperial forces will put up no more than a token resistance here and fall back to defend hives that are still worth defending. It is likely the Warlord will obliterate Hades from orbit rather than seek to take it. We cannot let this hive fall. It is a symbol of mankind's defiance with respect, Chaplain. Enough. Peace, Brother Captain Amaras. Grimaldus speaks with wisdom. Grimaldus inclined his head in thanks. I will not be silenced by a mortal. Amaris growled, but the fight was gone from him. Yarrick, the thin, ancient commissar, just stared at the Astartes captain. After several moments, Amaris looked back at the hololithic topography around the hive. Yarrick turned back to the gathered officers his one human eye stern, his augmentic one whirring in its socket, as it refocused on the faces before him. Hades will not survive the first week. We must abandon the hive and spread the forces here to other bastions of strength. This is not the second war. What is coming in system now far exceeds what has led waste to the planet before. The other hives must be reinforced a thousand times over. <coughs> He took a moment to clear his throat. A cough stole over him, dry and hoarse. When it subsided, the old man smiled without even the ghost of humor. Hades will burn. We must make our stand elsewhere. At this cue, General Koro stepped forward with a data slate. We come to the divisions of command. The fleet that will besiege Armageddon is too vast to repel. A chorus of jeers rose. Kurov rode them out. Grimaldus, Helbrecht, and Bayard were amongst those that remained absolutely silent. Hear me, friends and brothers, and hear me well. Those of you who insist this war will be anything more than a conflict of bitter attrition are deceiving yourselves. At current estimates, we have over 50,000 Astartes in the Armageddon subsector, and 30 times the number of Imperial Guardsmen, and it will not be enough to secure a clean victory. At our best estimations, 
Battle Fleet Armageddon, the orbital defenses, and the Astartes fleets remaining in the void will be able to deny the enemy landing for nine days. These are our best estimates. And the worst, asked an Astartes officer, bedecked in white wolf furs, wearing the grey warplate of the space wolves. His body language betrayed his impatience. He almost paced like a canine in a cage. Four days, the old man said through his grim smile. The anguish of the earth absolves our eyes, till beauty shines in all that we can see. War is our scourge, yet war has made us wise, and fighting for our freedom we are free. Horror of wounds and anger at the foe, and loss of things desired, all these must pass. We are the happy legion, for we know. Times but a golden wind that shakes the grass. There was an hour when we were loth to part. From life we longed to share no less than others. Now having claimed this heritage of heart, what need we more, my comrades and my brothers? Never before had the Orc menace been greater. Gazgul had achieved what we thought impossible. He has united hundreds of war bands, but with a single goal. The total and utter destruction of humanity in the Armageddon Sector. Arrayed against his barbaric horde is the greatest force of arms the Imperium has mustered since the time of Lord Solar Macarius. The fate of a hundred worlds will be decided on the blood-soaked ash dunes of Armageddon, and we cannot afford to fail. It is the grim dark future. To be a man in such times is to be one amongst untold billions. It is to live in the cruelest and most bloody regime imaginable. But to look upon the ancient figure, decorated in a sharp black uniform, with eyes of cold hatred and zealotry, is to feel hope and fear. To Armageddon, Yarrick returned in the year 998 M41, as the Imperium prepared for the Third War of Armageddon. In the decades since the defeat and escape at Golgotha, Yarrick hadn't ended his hunt for the Orc Prophet. He had returned in vengeance to Golgotha, at the head of a Mechanicus force, its ranks filled with Titans, Skitari, and Ordinatus engines, to scour the world of Orcs. The dead of Golgotha had been avenged, but still Gaskell evaded Yarrick. The words, my best enemy, go to Armageddon, make ready for the greatest fight, hung in his head. Armageddon would be where the two rivals would meet again. Yarrick knew it. So when the call for aid came, the Imperium was ready. Many times the ancient Commissar was offered a life of peaceful retirement. But Yarrick's vow to the Emperor, his hate for Gaskell was greater. Armageddon, that smog-filled hellscape that still bore many scars from the last time Yarrick had battled upon its surface. The decade since Yarrick's victory and the death of Ugulhard had seen the Imperium rebuild it into an even greater bastion. Generations had been born since that time of legend, but all of them knew the name of the hero of Armageddon. Yarrick sat at the head of the gathering, chapter masters, colonels, and contingents from every force of the Imperium were present, all looking at the Commissar before them. The man speaking to them was ancient, and he looked every hour his age. What kept him on his feet is a mixture of minimal rejuvenated chem surgeries, crude bionics, and a faith in the Emperor, founded in hatred for the enemies of man. 
Ordinarily, a mere commissar had no right to even speak at a gathering as momentous as this. But he is the old man, Old Bale Eye, a beloved hero of the Second War, 57 years ago. Not just a hero, THE hero. And his name is Sebastian Yarrick. Cold fire, much like the look he had seen in his grandfather's eyes, peered over the delegation as he uttered the words, Hades Hive will not survive the first week. His declaration was challenged by one of the Emperor's own angels of death. But what validation did the Astartes protest have but to the man who had observed and learned for decades about the prophet, Gazkul Mag Uruk Thraka? Another voice joined Yarrick, Reclusiarch Grimaldus of the Black Templars. The Greenskins do not come to Armageddon for vengeance, or to seek to bleed us for their defeat. They have suffered at Imperial hands in the past. They come for the pleasure of violence. Hades would burn because the Orcs wanted a proper fight, not a detracted siege. Again the protests rose, but Yarrick silenced them. Every soldier is a politician to some degree. The higher the rank, the greater the degree. So the student of Lord Commissar Rasp played the part, putting the Astartes in his place, squashing all doubts and unifying the room. Hades will not survive the first week. We must abandon the hive and spread the forces here to other bastions of strength. This is not the second war. And what is coming in system now far exceeds what has laid waste to the planet before. The other highs must be reinforced a thousand times over. With the proclamation done, the ancient being, the hero of Armageddon took command of the Imperium's forces, waiting for Gazkul and his war to darken the skies. It didn't take long for one of the greatest war the Imperium had ever seen to enter the Armageddon system. At the head of an Imperial contingent, so mighty its numbers hadn't been seen for millennia, stood Commissar Sebastian Yarrick. Once again the blaze reflected in those eyes as enormous fortress asteroids rocketed down towards the surface, one completely obliterating Hades' hive off the face of the planet. The fortress rocks of Gazkul's war slammed into other numerous points all over the planet, ready to unleash the greenskin tide. But there he stood, old Bale Eye, ready for them. With over 50,000 Astartes and millions of guard from regiments such as the Cadians and Steel Legion, Yarrick unleashed a wave of Imperial ordnance. The munitions, Laz and Bolter blotted out the sun as Yarrick, atop his reforged personal Baneblade, roared a challenge to the Greenskins. His eye blazing with killing ruby light as old Bale Eye burned fear into the Xenos scum. Being a symbol was nothing. Being a legend was the part he played, a symbol for the Imperium and its enemies. The Orc Hordes, under Gazgul clashed with Yarrick's troops, as the battle spread out like an infection across the world to the other hives. It was beautiful, the counterattacks and defeats Yarrick thrust upon his rival. The anguish of Earth absolves our eyes, till beauty shines in all we can see, and there was nothing more beautiful than the destruction of the Emperor's enemies. Many times a life of peace could have been his, but now, having claimed his heritage of heart, what need we more, my comrades and brothers? He hated Gaskell, but yet in the core of his being, the part he knew was there and rejected was the bond he and the Prophet shared, the heritage of heart, the love of war. For months, the two rivals who had observed and learnt about each other for decades clashed, 
a war that piled the dead in the millions as the orcs and imperials fought from the jungles to the ash wastes all the way to the intimately brutal face-to-face -face conflicts in the hive cities. A war of legend that would give rise to many heroes until the Imperials exhausted the war of Gazkul. Again to the stars, Yarrick chased his hated foe, joining the Black Templar's crusade fleet. And after months of pursuit, Yarrick and Helbrecht were finally able to catch up to Gazkul, cornering his flagship Kill Wrecker in the ensuing Battle of Haunted Gulf. But again, the Orc Prophet escaped. Yarrick slumped to the floor. He was tired and old. He knew that his escape meant ill for the galaxy. An Orc who watched and learned, planned and strategized. An Orc who meditated and kept his thoughts to himself. There could be nothing more dangerous. From the bells of lost souls in the Imperial Palace on Terror, a ring echoes throughout the Imperium. A reported demise of an Imperial legend is sung. Rumors of the boy from Teos III, student of Rasp, hero of Armageddon, the old man, old Bale Eye, the Commissar Sebastian Yarrick, has finally joined the Emperor at his side. The illumination of the end, a mystery, a story to be told, a glorious death where legend clashes with legend.